Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Let's begin there. Dagan, how are you today, my friend? Look at this bunch. You know what happened to me right before we started rolling? The dog threw up all over the place. Do you ever have one of those pet owner moments where, you know, like we have one dog and one cat, but it's just one of those days where it just feels like you're running a kennel. You know, it's like, what what is happening? Why is two animals such a... Why is it such a load? Feline you know AIDS. I mean? <laughs> Would you like a solution to that? Give me, give me it, Jaffe. Go to YouTube. Yeah. Uh, not YouTube. Go to Instagram and watch like literally four or five minutes of sweet videos of cats and dogs because I have a big fucking dog and I adore him, but he's a pain in my butthole. Right. Right. Um, and some days I'll just be like, are you out of your mind that I have to put up with you? But. All I have to do is watch a couple of videos on Instagram of people and it's like, oh, the dog's running across the rainbow bridge to greet me when I die and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, I love my dog and I just want to <laughs> go That's a good play strategy. With yeah. That's a good, that's helpful. Yeah, well I like it. I like well, it. That's the voice of David Jaffe, much requested guest, uh, creative visionary behind God of War and Twisted Metal and many other things. Welcome to the, calling all cars. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Woo. I'm good. I appreciate you having me here. This is a this is a fun one. I like this new format. I like this new round. Uh, what, what 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 is it? A, a potpourri, uh, yeah. a smorgasbord, a cornucopia right. of topics. I think that's right. pretty fucking cool. And I love that it's doing well. That's awesome. Thank Makes you. Me happy, but I'm 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 doing really well. I'm doing really good. Thank you all. It's good to see you, my friend. And uh, you know, I'm I I kind of wonder about like, it, it, are you gonna come back and do another game i always think about this I, I'm, I want you to come back are you good you're good right I, uh, <laughs> am i good yeah. you're okay you don't need to you don't need to come back right or do you want to come back and make a game i Why don't have so any, i i don't well because i mean good is a, you know i mean yeah uh, so uh you know i'm working with poland right now as a consultant i'm enjoying that um I love doing what I'm doing now. I, I here, here's what it is, Colin. I, 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 I've made not even peace. Cause it sounds like I struggled with it. I didn't, but I really feel when I was making games, like the, 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 the time was so right for me and my sensibilities and my ability to connect with the politics at Sony and, and to be able to sort of generate what I needed and what I wanted and when I now look at the landscape, everything from what a lot of mainstream gamers like to play to how much harder it is and different it is to sort of get what you need at Sony, given the games are 200 plus million dollar investments and there's a million cooks in the kitchen. I'm just like that. I, I if, if I were to have started in games today at Sony, I wouldn't have done what I did because it just it's not doesn't seem fun to me. So I, I'm loving what I'm doing now. The freedom I have doing YouTube, the freedom I have doing videos is very similar to the freedom I had when I was at PlayStation, sort of at the height of the PS1, PS2, a little PS3 era. So to me, that's the drug I chase. So I don't feel that much different. I wake up every day and I go, ooh, you know what I could do? I could make a a really cheap puppet of Jim Ryan and have him sleeping in bed with Yves Gelmont and talking about, you know, the Sony acquisition or they might. And I do. And some people love it. A lot of people think it's stupid, but I go to bed going, I did exactly what I wanted today. And I can't complain. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm pleased that you're still one of the most interesting people I've ever met in the industry all of this time later. And it's, it would be so funny to insert you and the interviews and the experiences I had with you when I was younger into the modern era, because I don't think the modern journalists would even know what to do with you at all. I, Um, I, I, PR didn't know what to do with me. They did not like me. I don't think they still like me. No, they definitely um, don't like me either. No worries. I know they don't like you. They don't, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's a badge of honor. I mean, I agree. I have an adversarial relationship with Sony. I always said that. Yeah. So I, and think, I don't I even mean that in a negative way towards them. They're doing their job. But, mm-hmm. you know, 
your job is not their job. You're not a PR. Right. I, that's, that's why I don't get like some of these. I get it. I, I don't, I know this isn't what the show's about, but I, you can just cut this out. Dustin. Uh, I was, I was, I was thinking about this. Um, as I heard you talking, I don't know where it was because you guys put out so much great content, but you were talking Thank about you. that relationship and you were talking about, um, you don't really care about getting games and going to junkets and all this shit. And at first I was like, why are a lot of these guys that do that, that sort of, you know, uh, shake the hand of the industry so popular and so beloved with their shows and their podcasts and things like that. And then I just started thinking about it. It's like, you know, the number of people that actually want the truth or want at least your attempt at the truth is probably massively dwarfed in an entertainment medium compared to the people who just want their what they already like parroted back to them because they just tune into this stuff because they want to, you know, listen about the stuff they love. And I, and, and I get that. I just I don't know how you could do that every day of your life. It just seems like you're fucking. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say what I'm thinking, so I'm not going to say that, but <laughs> it, it, ju it, it just seems like you're trying to, you know, please uh, uh, the people in charge. And that seems pathetic to me. Yeah, I agree. So I'm glad we're on the on the same page. And when I let go of the PR relationship, the game a few years ago and just totally I was already cut off by a bunch of people. But when I when I just stopped. Um, I felt so much more relief, you know, I was like, I don't have to do, I don't have to, it wasn't that I was pulling punches. It's that I was concerned about what I was getting. Like we still haven't even played Resident Evil four and it kind of feels good. It's like, I'm going to play it with everyone else now. So anyway, we can talk about all that later. But Diablo yeah. is this weekend. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. Diablo you got, you is got a few weekend. more days until uh, days and then you got to put it away till June. Resident Evil four is next week. Anyway, no, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, no worries, man. No worries. I'm I found that I was blocked by the Diablo Twitter account. I have no idea. I've never even played Diablo in my entire life. So oh, who knows? Wow. About, uh, well, blockchain activity. And, and finally, Dustin Furman, executive producer. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing all right. I was telling Colin, I was telling you before the show started that I woke up just immediately a, a pulled muscle in my neck. I felt like I was dying just immediately as soon as you wake up. So that's a great feeling. But despite that, having a pretty good day so far. I got to be honest about having Jaffe on the show. So Micah and I were planning out guests in the future. I said, we got to have Jaffe. She's like, cool. And then we were playing. She's like, who else should be on the show? I said, me, me. I'm making the decision. I'm on the show. I don't pull the executive producer punches all that often. But on this one, I said, no, I want to be on with Jaffe. Now, Jaffe and I have had some um, Twitter beef, we might say, some back and forth. But I just, I just think because you're rubbish at Call of Duty, that's the only oh, issue yeah. I have. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. I was about to compliment you, Jaffe. Now you ruined it. I was going to say because deep down, I, I adore Jaffe. But, Thank uh, you. I, I adore you as that. well. What beef have we had? I'm trying to remember something about me calling you an old man or something. Like we had that back and forth last year that we were. It was it was all in jest, of course. But oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could start a real beef, too, if you want. That's no, I, I have you muted, so I don't know what you say about me half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, all right, let's get into the show, my friends. And it's good to be here with Jaffe. It's good to have this group together. I'm looking at the, the topics. Um, I actually want to start with you this week, Dustin, because I'm yeah. curious about what you have to say here. I feel like there's a story behind this or something, oh, yeah. but uh, I'm I'm all about etiquette generally. And so I want to hear specifically what you have to say about this topic. Yeah, I have. I actually have notes that I wrote down for this topic. I'm very <laughs> passionate and some of our listeners may remember a few months back that there was an ongoing conversation on sacred symbols about uh, concert etiquette and how you should behave and shouldn't behave when you go to see a live band perform. Controversial, similar, controversial topic, controversial topic. And so I feel like I may be going into uh, controversial topics right now with this. And that is movie theater etiquette, something that's very well. I would say it's very important to me. It's important for me to do when I'm at the theater, but it is so important that it's ruined going to movies for me because I feel like there's such a lack of movie theater etiquette. Maybe this is a, a regional thing based on what movie theaters you go to. And I know that's entirely possible, but I have had so many bad experiences with other guests at movie theaters. Very rarely is there a problem with the staff or the way that the theater set up, whatever. That's all 
pretty easy things to take care of. But I am often shocked by how other people behave at movie theaters. And I, I told you guys I wrote some notes. And so I wanted to share some specific examples of things that I've seen at movie theaters that just <laughs> complete. It, it keeps me up at night when I think about it. Oh, wow. So first of all, it's the talking during the movie. Oh. Everyone knows you shouldn't talk, but this is the number one broken rule at the movie theater. And sometimes it goes beyond just a little whispering between two people. I can deal with that every once in a while. You know, some, some people are whispering about, okay, I saw, uh, what was it? Dr. Strange in the movie theaters and somebody during a part that was, uh, pretty important to the story. This, this woman, either like a row to her head was so loud said, Oh, that's symbolic (laughs) that everyone in the theater heard her during this moment, everyone. And this, she said other things during the, the during the show as well, but that was the main thing that stuck out to the point when now where if I'm watching a movie and I feel like something is too on the nose, I'll say, I'll, I'll tell Holly and say, oh, that's symbolic, like that lady. <laughs> what was my mother-in-law doing in Pittsburgh? That's weird. <laughs> that's strange. That's strange. Oh, <laughs> so, so there's this, you know, the people that are talking too loud, uh, talking about the movie, but I've seen other things as well, where another example is when I saw, I think it was Alien Resurrection, whatever the most recent Alien movie was. I believe I was at a showing that was after 11 p.m. at night and I'm waiting and up to the side of the aisle, up the stadium seating, I see a toddler walking up with a parent that is not tall enough to reach the handrail. And I'm reminded this is 11 p.m. Maybe late, it might have been even midnight showing of this movie that's rated R. And I know parents, you know, you can decide whatever you want your kids to watch. But and, and luckily, this kid was mostly fine because uh, the kid fell asleep within probably 30 minutes. But for the first 30 minutes, that kid would not shut up. It's like this is not the right time or place for this. OK, and but the, a- issue, the issue was was the talking of the kid, not the fact that a parent decided if the kid had been quiet, you wouldn't care. Oh, it's twofold. No, I, I think that it, it was wrong for them to bring that kid to a rated R movie at that late of night as well. But also it was annoying for everybody else. Like, I just don't know. I just don't think that was the the right thing. So a few other random things that I've I've experienced was I saw Toy Story 4 at the IMAX. It's the climax of the movie. I won't go into details. Of course, it's a kid's movie. I'm not it's not like the end of the world. In walks this giant group into the IMAX theater and they look at the screen. They look at me and Holly. They look up at the screen and they do this probably four or five times over the course of like a minute. And then they yell up. They say, hey, is this the end of the movie? I say, yeah. And then they leave. They just walked into the wrong showtime and then left. Now, that (laughs) honest mistake. But that was honestly just a funny situation. But I've seen everything. I've seen people watch you know looking at youtube on their phone during a movie someone that's bored like a friend that got brought along something like that uh i've seen people you know every once in a while you get into a theater this this has maybe happened one time to me but there's the funny guy the performer who says something just loud enough that he thinks he's being funny and making a joke that the rest of the theater hears. And if man, sometimes if people laugh and encourage that, I can't stand it. It's like, don't encourage this guy. Ruin Schindler's list for me. I agree. Oh, no. What? Well, because he he thought it was funny that the projector was broken and the whole thing was in black and white. And it's like, dude, it's fine. We can appreciate it. Even if it's in black and white, don't worry about it. And he kept making jokes about it. And you know, I hated it. Ruined the whole movie. (laughs) Oh man. See that it, it's funny because these these stories are funny, not when you're the person who's dealing with it in the moment. Totally. But so I'm curious if you guys feel as strongly as I do. I obviously know there are exceptions. For example, the the Super Mario movie is coming out in a few weeks, and I expect that when I go, there are going to be kids and they're going to be kids in the theater. And that's that's fine. I'm an adult going to see a movie intended for children. I understand certain contexts of things. But at the same time, it's I feel like, man, enjoy the movie the way you want to. But if you're annoying everyone else in the theater, it's not okay. 
Some theaters have gotten really good about this, though. I know that when I go to my parents' house, we go to the Alamo Draft House, and they have very strict rules. And they'll even you can you can write something down on a note, say, "Hey, this person won't shut up," and they'll deal with it for you, so you don't have to be the the person that tells them to be quiet. Because I'm I'm not that guy normally. I think a few times I have shushed people in a theater when it's been egregious, but I'm just I can't do it. I'm too. I'm too. I just won't be. I the don't guy. think I've ever shushed a person in my Never life. Never shushed. No. Uh, Never shushed. This was one time, I think, and it was very, <laughs> very. Yeah, it was so <laughs> egregious. <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, but that's. I don't. I've I've had some cool experiences too. Not that everything's been bad. When I saw the last Harry Potter movie, there were two guys dressed as Voldemort, and so before the movie started, they they jokingly like fought each other like did a wizard battle in front of the theater and it was fun like there's some nice camaraderie moments of course but so i'll pitch this over to you guys am i too obsessed with the ideal experience and i just need to shut the fuck up and (laughs) and let people be or have people lost their way and have turned the movie theater into a not so sacred place that it once was Hmm. those are the only two choices uh, you can take it however you want, Jappy. I mean, I, I have thoughts, but I'll I'm the guest. I'll wait for you guys to speak up first. But I'm I definitely got some damn thoughts. Oh. Well, Dust, here, you, yeah. you triggered me, first of all, oh. unnecessarily, because I thought the kids were gonna browbeat you and Holly for being in a kids movie. I got very ratcheted <laughs> up. I don't know if you noticed my face. I was like, oh, where's <laughs> this is not, you know, and I, I wasn't even thinking about this. You've opened up so many can of worms for me here. Dust. I don't even know where to start. You know, the first thing when you emailed the topic, the first thing I thought of was my new obsession, John Mulaney, the stand up comedian. He tells a story about one of his, he's like, you know, a Seinfeld fan, sort of a Seinfeld protege in a lot of ways. But he tells a story about one of the greatest things he feels that Seinfeld ever said, but one of the darkest bits of comedy he thinks that's ever come out where, and we haven't talked about this yet. Where Seinfeld says he goes into a movie, he pays this price for a soft drink, he pays this exorbitant amount for a popcorn, pays this much for Raisinets, the cost of the movie ticket, super expensive. He said, when that film ends and the lights go on, I open my hand. <laughs> In other words, I just leave the garbage on the floor. <laughs> for so It's like brutally honest and it is kind of a dark side of humanity, you know? So that was the first thing I thought of where it was like, I remember kind of being like that in my younger years, like being kind of having that, like, I don't know, that, that mindset of, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave this mess, but it's kind of shooting the messenger. Like the guy getting paid $7 an hour to clean up the movie theater after the film rolls is kind of, you know, you're punishing the wrong person. Exactly. Right. And then when I had kids, when we had kids, you kind of got to re-examine those behaviors a little bit because you want to set the right example. So I think that was one thing I thought of. But then the other thing that I, I, this is dark digging coming out a little bit here, Dust, but you were saying you kind of took exception to the kid that was way too young to be in the Aliens film. But there's kind of that part of me that says, you know what? I kind of like that mm-hmm. we're kind of scarring the kids a little bit. because I we saw grew- Jaws at five years old in the theater. We, and we were ruined, right, Jeff? We were it ruined by stuff who like I that. am today, for better or worse. <laughs> I loved it. Loved it. My sister and her husband took me and my brother, scared the shit out of my brother. Uh, I just thought it was the greatest thing. And I still have, I have actual memories from that experience. I know where I sat. I remember certain shots. I loved it. Awesome. Yeah, because you're not, re- you're seeing something you're not ready for. And I think that's much less of a thing now than with us, you know, gener- generation Xers and the gen gen wires and stuff like you know now it's you know you want to kind of embed that kid with a little bit of that neuroses and stuff like that that's gonna that's gonna be where the comedy comes from and the creativity and stuff like creativity that. yeah absolutely right so that's right. gonna fuel all that kind of thing and to be that's, clear because jeff yeah. you mentioned you were five about this kid was not old enough to say the name of the movie <laughs> Like that's why I think it's somewhat incidental that it was he was even there. He wouldn't even remember it. In other yeah. words, yeah, it's like yeah, he could yeah. be a I, hardcore, I, watching yeah. a hardcore porn in a fucking triple X theater, and I don't think he would ever remember anything about it. I think the issue I had with that was he was talking. If he was right. was was not talking, I would say to you, Dustin, mind your own fucking business. Um, okay. okay. But if he was talking, you, you, that's different. 
that's your hundred percent in the right there. If he's just disturbing the film. Yeah. You almost expect that in a G rated movie. It's like you're going in as an right. adult animation fan. You go to a Pixar film or DreamWorks film. Uh, exactly. Despicable me or something. And you're going to kind of, that's going to come with the territory, but I understand what you're saying with that. You know what I had? I mean, we're back to the movies now. We all took a couple of years. A lot of us took a couple of years off. It was probably Top Gun Maverick that got my fanny back in the seats. You know, I did the Paramount thing. We and we ended up going like a week before they put it on Paramount Plus. It was like I gotta see this on the big screen. And then since then, saw saw a couple of movies in the little indie uh, county movie theater, the little art art theater. Saw the whale and saw a twenty fours after sun. And you know what I was surprised about? You think you're going to the indie movie house? It's a higher class of people, maybe film buffs. They're going to be respectful. They taught they, the people were talking so much in the whale that oh, I wow. I thought I was in like a you know like a a Lowe's you know <laughs> or Regal Cinema. It was like wow, I thought this was going to be like the film people. It's a Darren what Aronofsky. Were they, I'm cu- I, I am curious. I'm not. I'm not doing a bit. But what were they talking about? In they were just list? having Jaffe. They were just having straight up conversations about the movie, whether whether it was about Brendan Fraser or you know whatever Darren Aronofsky, whatever they were saying. Right. I, and I think that was the difference. It was probably a little bit of a. It was probably a little bit of an elevated film talk. It wasn't the banter that you would hear at like a regular quote unquote you know, blockbuster yeah. film or something. I asked you yeah, because the whale is, you know, as a fat guy, I will tell you, um, the whale is like, and I haven't seen it. I hear it's really depressing and stuff, but yeah, it's um, you, you know, fat shaming and, and fat phobia and all that stuff is, is really one of those last, uh, it's kind of cliche to say, but it's true. It's kind of like one of the last things that it's okay to publicly mock. And I, I think there are certain movies that make people uncomfortable yeah. And so they either laugh or make jokes or, and so I was wondering, you know, was it a different kind of disturbance from the audience versus just go into a fucking, you know, Kevin Smith movie and everybody's stoned and going, dude, look at that fucking guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, was there a distinction or not really? It wasn't about that. That's a really interesting point because I think it wasn't about that. It wasn't any kind of uh, mean spirited, you know, riffing and stuff like that. It wasn't anything like that. Or poking fun. But I think if you played the whale at the Regal Cinema, at the main, you know, multiplex, then it could have been, it could have went to that kind of audience. So it was, that would, but that was also the shock. It was like a certain level of audience. It was older people. That you have to be somewhat informed. I mean, the whale is kind of a weird example because there was so much Oscar buzz around it that it mm. became very mainstreamy. But you just expected a different, you know, a more serious moviegoer that would kind of fall in line with everything Dustin's saying. Like, let's yeah. go to the movies. Let's be respectful. Let's be quiet. Keep it down to a low, a low roar. But that was the thing. It was like they were just talking out loud, and you know, it was yeah. maybe it was educated talk, but it was still like, and that that come maybe comes back to the point of like Dustin's um, example of somebody who's calling out like you know, trying to look like, oh, that's foreshadowing or, you know, that's symbolism or whatever. <laughs> it was almost like that sort of thing. Like, look how smart I am. You know, yeah, going to it. Dr. Strange, the name itself should tip <laughs> you off. It's like, it's so weird. His name is Dr. Strange in the movie Strange. I know, you know. Um, I want to jump in here quick because something came to mind for me. I don't have a whole lot of passion about the movie etiquette topic per se, but I have a, a real passion about etiquette. Mm. And this is what I said at the top. Like people just need to be aware of themselves. And if you're not, I don't like or respect you at all. Like, that's just the case. Like, you know what it reminds me of when I lived in San Francisco and I used to take the train to IGN every day, the subway. I remember constantly people used to just listen to their music like on their phone. And I saw a couple of times someone like literally throw someone's phone across the train for doing like someone with with like alpha energy and other people say things or whatever. But most of the time we would just deal with it. You didn't want to have a confrontation. I want to get fucking stabbed or shot or something like that. And uh, that to me is like so heinous that I can't even believe that you would do that to in, 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 like I would be. First of all, our parents would have beaten the shit out of us if we ever tried to do something like that. That's number one. <laughs> Second of all, I can't believe that. And I actually introduced our sisters at dinner a couple nights ago to this idea of main character energy. 
And um, I was talking about someone we all know, we we in our family know that I think has like serious main character energy and they never heard that before. And I was like, just the idea that everything revolves around them. And that's the kind of people you're describing. If you go to a movie theater, fucking be quiet. Stay off your phone. Why is that so hard? Why do, why is the exception, you have the, 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 the why are you the exception to the rule? But yeah, I, have a, I, have a couple, I have a couple funny things to say. One thing about the movies that I do remember, and I'm sure you all remember this, maybe not Dustin, because although he probably does too, is in the 90s when people started bringing laser pointers to the movies. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but that was like, there was an era of probably two years or so where people thought that was the funniest shit. And in fact, there's a Seinfeld episode that, that has that as like one of the beats in the story. And so I always think about that because that was a thing where people would like to take the laser pointer and put it around the person's boob or something. And, or like, you know, like around, the, it was so stupid. So that's like what I think about with theater and the lack of etiquette. But um, the second thing I was thinking of is I have an ex who like really hadn't did, lacked self-awareness in these examples, uh, in these situations to the point where there were probably five or six different times in our relationship where I was like, I'm leaving in, in different situations where I'm like, I'm out. And one of them, it's ironic you brought up Seinfeld because we went and saw Jerry Seinfeld live. And I've said the story in the past. One of my very favorite people in the world mortified to ever have a bad interaction with Jerry Seinfeld. Right. <laughs> I'd probably kill myself if I if I had a bad interaction with Jerry Seinfeld. And she Why was on Colin her, do it. She was, <laughs> she was on if if, if your if your laundry has blood on it, maybe laundry isn't your biggest problem right now, um, <laughs> as he would say. So I there was a she was on her phone and the people around us were like, can you get off your fucking phone? You know? And I literally got up and was like, there's no way I'm risking this. Like him seeing this, you know? And I literally just left and like went oh. out into the hallway for like five minutes and then came back. Cause there was like, when it was all done, so I'm like, there's just no, I, there's no way I'm paying the price for this. You know? <laughs> and uh, so I totally understand the etiquette thing. And it really bothers me. A good example is, uh, our sisters live in our, my area here in Virginia. So we go to dinner once in a while and we went to dinner a few times ago and there, it was a kind of an empty, it wasn't, it was the restaurant was starting to fill in, but there were these people that were getting up and then they just stood right next to our table <laughs> and talked to each other. And to the point where we said something to them and I had like a weird interaction with them, but it's one of those things like, why are you making me say this? Why are you making me do this? And that's what I feel etiquette is all about. It's about not putting other people in strange positions. Is it like and, the bathroom when you're in the stall and, and there's like six other stalls and they pick the one right next to oh, right. Oh, man. Or and urinal, like, too. Urinal is bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't it's understand that. I don't either. I don't know, Jaffe, and I'll kick it over to you because to me, I feel like etiquette generally in movies, and this would go into movies and anything, it's just, it's just be aware of yourself. I, I am mortified if I'm in someone's way. I am mortified if I'm putting someone out. I am mortified when I ask someone a favor. I am more, so like, I just want to be there and then be invisible. I'm here to see the movie or I'm here to do this. I'm at the museum. I'm doing whatever. I'm not trying to make a scene. I don't want to be in your way. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you to be mad at me. And I just want to get out of here. Right. That's literally my whole MO in life. And people that don't <laughs> seriously, like, I don't want to have confrontation. I don't want to put you out in any way. I want to just kind of fit in, do what I'm doing and get out. And I think that's what etiquette is all about. It's when you, it's when you let it go. It sounds so, uh, um, um, it, it's just like it, you, it's, I, you have a therapist. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I thank do. God. Yeah. yeah. We'll <laughs> get into like, that later with my topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's like, all I want out of this life, I want to get in. I don't want to bother anybody and I want to get out. That's it. And I'm going to be 98 years old going, oh, thank God I didn't bother anybody. You're right. That's just, you know. Exactly. I am very, it's funny because I have this reputation in parts of the internet where I'm like very, a very aggro in some way, but I'm actually not. I'm actually very, very averse to confrontation. Everyone in my life that knows me knows that. And um, compared to our sisters or our mom or something like who are like firecrackers, basically, right. I'm just like, I don't want to have anything to do with anything that's going to. And now with phone, camera phones and everything, it's like, I don't want to have a public oh. freak out situation. I don't want to be castigated and made fun of. I don't want to be shamed. So I'm just literally sitting there being like, please don't notice me. Uh, Jaffe, what do you think about this uh, movie theater etiquette topic? What comes well, to I mind have, for you? I have some notes and they're all over the place like my mind. The first one is, of course, um, the Toy Story uh, 4 <laughs> episode. I would have been like, if they would have said, is this the end of the movie? I would have been like, no, no, no. Pixar is trying like a Pulp Fiction thing. Trust me, sit down. You'll be fine. This is the right <laughs> start. They're just telling it out of order. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that comes to mind that's not quite yet relevant is uh, you. Ha I have to assume this ex, Colin, 
that you got up and left. Like her girlfriends are probably to this day going, Oh my God, do you remember that guy? Yeah. He was oh. so fucking everything it, embarrassed him. You, you dodged a bullet girl. That's oh, yeah. probably what they're sitting around saying. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I mean, should we, uh, yeah, I think we simultaneously agent Smith to each other, you know, where we're just like, like okay, and we have two so, ships in the night. <laughs> I, okay. So I, I will say this about it. Um, uh, I think, okay. I think that, the movies and I grew up in Alabama seeing movies. And then I went out to LA, which is sort of the, the, the Mecca of motion pictures and, and, and theaters, especially back then. Like we went to Westwood uh, by UCLA every Friday night uh, as USC students. Cause we didn't have anything like that. And there was like 15 movie theaters within two blocks of each other. So it was just like a film festival every weekend. Right. So I've, I've run the gambit of, of, of different theater experiences and uh, I, I think it's like if you go to the opera or the ballet, there's a certain way to act. And I think if you go uh, to see comedy at the Apollo, there's a certain way to act. There's like a decorum that's already set. So I would say if you're watching The Whale, I think, uh, or you know, or, uh, uh, you know, some Oscar nominate or some emotional film or something, I think there is an expectation that most you know, self-aware people bring to that kind of movie. But I think it's unrealistic and unfair that if you're going to see, uh, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons in Westwood at the 11 o'clock showing and half the people are high as shit and, and, and you're kind of like going, and you're, and you're kind of like going, Shh, I'm trying to understand the motivation of Chris Pine's character when he decides to pick up the gold. And it's like, <laughs> you're in the wrong fucking movie theater, sir. Um, so I, I, I do, I, you know, I, I remember seeing, um, I saw the, it's, it's, no one talks about it. it's a brilliant movie, uh, boomerang with Eddie Murphy from the nineties. And, uh, it, it, it's very like, I don't think there's one white person in the movie, in the, in the, in the cast. And I think I remember Eddie Murphy saying, yeah, I wanted to do that. I wanted to make a pure black centric movie that was still mainstream, a lot of money. Cause I didn't see a lot of that growing up. They were always these kind of low budget black exploitation things. And so I saw that movie with my wife at the time in Culver City, and this was before Culver City got sort of gentrified. So that was the theater on the west side of L.A. where you had a lot more of the black audience would go and there were more black films in, you know, that were more ta like uh, Medea movies and all that would open there, but they probably wouldn't open at the Fox in Westwood. And that experience was amazing because every the etiquette there I was new to. But to see a black centric movie with a black focus centric audience and, it, it, you know, I, I don't go to church. Right. I don't I'm not a religious person, but I've seen the movies like what black churches seem like. And it was such a joy to watch that movie in that theater with those people because they wouldn't shut up. It was almost as if it was an interactive movie and, it, it, you know, and it, it was delightful. So I, I guess my bigger point is that, you know. I think you have to, if you go into every movie with an expectation that the decorum is the same, I think perhaps you're the one lacking self-awareness, okay. not mm. the audience uh, that that's bothering you, uh, which is not to say you don't have a point about certain movies. Um, and the other thing I'll say is I, I, I'm a bit more compassionate, I guess, with the self-aware thing. I get it. It drives me batshit. I'm with you. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't deny anybody that frustration. But I think two things are happening with movies. One is the pandemic has sort of almost retrained people from watching movies at home, especially if you're older. You're like, well, I talk to my friends all the time when I'm watching the movie. It's like, you're not at home anymore. That was a two year stretch. You got to retrain your brain mm. a little bit. But the other part is, you know, I, my kid used to play softball and I sat behind this lady. She came every week and she just bathed herself in this perfume. Um, and my first reaction was, are you a fucking moron? Are you not aware? Blah, 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 blah. But then, you know, you more think about it, you're like, maybe she's like smells bad. Or maybe somebody told her she smelled bad when she was like fifth grade. And she's carried this fucking bag of hammers with her her whole life. And it's like, uh, you know, as I get older, I get a little more compassionate. But I don't mm. think you're wrong to be annoyed. 
I think if you go to the Alamo Draft House, which I would love to go to, I've heard great things. Oh, it's I'm so really, good, dude. It's so I, good. I, I read about that when uh, back when Ain't It Cool News was an actual valid site and stuff. And I was like, that sounds awesome. If you go to that or the Arclight or something, you have every expectation to have a great uh, 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 cinema aficionado experience. But, you know, if you go to a fucking strip mall movie theater to watch, you know, Alvin and the Chipmunks 4, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what I would say. Yo, that's fair enough. You know, you make an interesting point, too, about the venue, I think, is important. And also my my expectations also are as I get older are changing, too, or just my reactions. Because Dagan and I were saying on a previous episode that and I don't know if you can relate to this, Jaffe, but in, in New York, respect at least the way we were brought up in, in social interactions was like, get what you want, get the fuck out of the way. Right. So like go to the deli. Hey, how you doing? All right. Time. I want this. This. All right. Great. Step aside. Pay your money. Leave. That's like a sign of respect. If you take that too much of that guy's time. Right. Then right, that's right. a different kind of thing. And that but down here in the South. Mm-hmm. If you t- treat someone like that, that's not going to work. You know, how are you doing? Oh, what are you doing? Literally, I'm, I'm walking out of fucking BJ's with like a huge two pound bags of nuts and like someone's bacon today. You know, if someone said that to someone on Long Island, they'd probably get the fucking nut bag to, to the side of the head. Oh, boys, come yeah. on. You still, <laughs> you still hating them women? You still hate the women? Oh, I hate them All women. Right. Come on over here. I mean, yeah, I grew up in Alabama. I know exactly what you mean. Right. Absolutely. So, so, the expect, so that's true in the sense that like you kind of have to check where you are and what you're doing and. Mm. And all the rest. And I think that, too. And I, I think about it. I bring that up because I went and saw the Down Abbey movie, the most recent one in the theater. I love Down Abbey, as everyone knows. And uh, that was the last movie I think I saw in the theater. And I went to get concessions. And then these three old ladies were on the concession line, but they were trying to buy tickets. So they were like in a totally wrong place. Right. And then the, they got up. So I, I, I went behind them. It was a mistake to go behind them. All the other lines are going quicker. But I'm trying to be patient at my, at my older age. And I was. But it was funny. They were at this thing for literally, I shit you not, 10 minutes. With the woman being very patient, they turn the monitor around. They're like, you know, trying to pick the tickets they want in the theater and all this. This is all going on. No one's saying a word. Right. And and to me, I'm like, I got to win in Rome. Right. I'm in Virginia. It's different here. But if, if literally that happened in New York, 10 seconds into that interaction and I, they would, someone would have literally thrown something at those ladies or been like, <laughs> you got, what the fuck's going on over here? Like, yeah. you know, so it's you got to. And I always encourage people the best way to see what it's like growing up on Long Island is to watch Long Island Railroad fight videos, like argument videos. They're fucking hysterical, dude. They're hysterical. I'm You've never writing seen it down. Like it. I'm writing yes. it down. So and I'll, I'll send you a couple of choice ones, Jeffy. They're just so funny because it's like every type of person on Long Island you could possibly imagine in this t- in this steel tube. So aggravated. They're all at the only thing they share with each other is they all hate each other. You know, like they That's all awesome. it's just hyster- it's hysterical. So it's just you're right. When in Rome, and I think that that's a really important lesson that I yeah. I, I learn as well. Um, have we, Dustin? Is there anything you know? Let's throw it I, back to you. I the have topic. one more thing to bring up. What I consider the most unforgivable sin, and I would imagine that you guys, this will be a unanimous agreement. Mm. And this scenario I, I've seen has been joked about. I think The Simpsons did a clip about this, but it's happened. It's happened not to me, but uh, I believe this happened to Holly. Before we saw The Force Awakens, we were waiting in line uh, Thursday night to see it. Somebody walks out of the theater. Oh, no. Spoils a oh, major thing no. in the movie because they're just talking out loud while everyone else is standing there. And Colin, I think this goes back to this idea of self awareness. You were walking out of the theater, it was obvious that people were waiting in line was it trolling or was the person just not aware not aware 100 percent, not trolling oh so and yeah, this is i've one seen of videos th- of people doing that too which is fucked up you know oh yeah dude, yeah when when the harry potter the final harry potter book came out and someone like wrote all the spoilers on their car and drove no. around and was like going to the different like book open like people getting dude, the there's book a special coming. place in hell for people like that i really do believe yeah. like people that want to kill other people's again. enjoyment for no reason is really that's a strange that's a that to me is psychopathic that's anyway, yeah, craziness ahead. yeah but even then i still think that obviously the the psychopathic behavior of the troll that's doing it on purpose that's bad but i also think that even if you're unintentional unintentionally doing it have some self-awareness 
just some level. Even I know. But how do you to, how do you do that? How do you cultivate? Because so, I don't yeah, think most people would know. disagree with you. But is it is it shaming them? Like I'll tell you, there was a case once. I was at a movie theater, and uh, I all the urinals were occupied. So I went into a stall. I leave the door open. I'm just peeing, and I pee, and I didn't flush the toilet. And I didn't flush the toilet because there was other, there was pee in there before. So I just assumed, okay, this would must not work. And there's a there's lot a of people. blend there. Yeah, yeah. there's a blend. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and this guy, and I don't know if I could have taken him or not. And I didn't really want to probably it was 50, 50 uh, in terms of size and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's just like, dude, flush the toilet. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? Do I fucking, do I reason with this guy? Do I explain why I didn't? Do I just go back and fucking flush it? Do I get in a fucking fight? It's like, I would flush it, but your fucking mom's in there. And I don't, you know, I don't know. What do I, what do, I do? And I ended up just saying, fuck it. I got to go home. I'm going to flush it. But um, I don't know what I was talking about, Dustin. Um, oh, self-awareness, right? Self-awareness. So yeah. that moment <clears throat> for me imprinted on my brain. It's like, you know what? Even though there's stuff in the toilet when I pee in it, it bothers some people. Okay. All right. That is, that is now a new piece of programming code that I have in my brain pan and I say, that's what I do now. So maybe the only way to really curate uh, self-awareness and other people is, it sounds not, not, not from a mean spirited place, but is to call them out and shame them. And that will kind of make a better person. I don't know if there's any other way to do it because if they're, if they're not self-aware, they're not going to just develop it in a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, is shame, a good point. Shame, I think is a really unique human trait that like is part of the evolutionary bond of humans, you know, to like, yeah. we're smart enough to know that you should be a shame. When, when my Boston Terriers are barking and going crazy, they have no fucking idea that they shouldn't be doing that. They're just doing it, you know, like that we can shame people into being like, you should feel bad. That's a whole new level of interaction that I think is probably very key to being human. Yeah. And we're all ashamed of things. It's so funny. You bring this up. I have never verbalized this before. It's kind of not ta it's tangential to this, but a whole bathroom thing. There's a restaurant in San Francisco, probably still there called Hops and Hominy. They have it's really nice. And they have these bathrooms that are all just individual rooms that you go into. And then they have like a shared trough. Oh, st sink. I love the rooms. I yeah. love bathroom stall rooms. Yeah. Wash I feel closets. so rich. Yeah. Oh, oh me too. I love it. I oh, love me too. It. I love it. I love it too. And <laughs> so I, I remember this so well because it was one of those shame moments, but like it was a passive funny thing, but I remember it and imprinted in me and, and changed my behavior in some way. It's probably 2015, 2016. I, I remember peeing and then I went to flush the toilet, but it didn't really take. You know when that happens when you like yeah. flush? Mm -hmm. So I was just like, fuck it. And I literally walked out and this girl was waiting and walked in and I was and I, in my mind, it went like this, like immediately. I went, I was like, oh, and I went back in and flushed the toilet. And she and was like. Why is a girl in the bathroom? Because like, they're, they're individual it's individual. Oh, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. And then they yeah, share yeah, things. Got right? it, so, got it. So she's waiting to go into the into the bathroom, and then I go in and, and flush it quickly. And in my mind, she and she laughed. She's like, "Oh, caught you or something like that." And in my in my mind, I really wanted to be like, "Well, what happened was I went to flush it. It didn't take. I was walking out. I didn't know anyone was going to see me or wait." But like, like to your point, you can't really explain it or be in that moment. Yeah. So I just yeah, took yeah. it, and I was like, that's, totally, and that's how I met your mother." Right. But it was a total lesson learned. So yeah, I would yeah. have just like, don't be lazy. You know, like, you, yeah, why, yeah. why did you do that? Yeah. And so yeah. it is a, I think it is a relevant, a relevant, uh, a relevant point. And I wanted to say this other thing real quick too. I actually am very curious about what you guys think of this shared spaces. Cause we're talking about etiquette and we're getting off the, the path. I know, but etiquette in places where we all go. Right. So I think airports, I was just in an airport. Right. And I used to fly all the time, just like Jaffe did a lot over there. I don't go anywhere anymore. So this was like, it's been a few years where I'm like, I haven't even been in a fucking airport. And we were just people watching eating. And the amount of dirt baggery that I saw on display in a half an hour or so really was mind blowing. People just eating and crumbs just spilling everywhere. A woman drops her bag, is carrying a baby. No one helps her. I get up and walk probably 20 feet to pick up her bag and help her. Right. Yeah, then the woman foul. next to me is like, you never see that anymore. Literally said that. <laughs> you don't. And I'm like, no shit. You really don't. Because no one treats them. No one treats anyone with any respect. And that kind of stuff bothers me where we're it's the same thing like on a train, on a plane, all these things like where we all are. I do feel like there has to be a baseline. There is no. I guess you have the level of like if you're on a spirit airline flight, you have a different expectation <laughs> than if you're on a Delta flight. But generally speaking, that's so sad. I feel like there has to be a general shared baseline in these shared spaces of decency, etiquette, so on and so forth. 
I think when you choose to go to a movie, you choose to go to a museum, you choose to do, then then obviously like I wrote down, if you go to Rocky Horror Picture Show, right, right. that's oh. going to be a fucking raucous thing. Yeah, you're in for a. Tr- yeah. I had my dick grabbed at one of those. Nice. Whoa, nice. Yeah. Sick. Man, Rocky, did you like it? <laughs> and that's I, how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I it was from my friend was in it, so it was well. I wouldn't say it was consensual, but I at least knew the guy. But uh, oh. it was unexpected. Right. It was my first time. Is it ever expected, like Dustin? <laughs> it surprised you? Wait, wait, I, well, I, I'm a married man, so sometimes it might be expected. Yes. Oh, I thought a guy grabbing it. Is oh no, I'm, no, no! That was the the one and only time a, a guy has grabbed my dick. No, 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 no. I mean, for me, um, what are you gay? Yeah. That's what someone that's what someone at home is saying right now. On, uh, <laughs> in there. Can I <laughs> subscribe? <laughs> By the way, I ask you guys to cut that out and just and use that without without the context. Uh, I have to comment, though, if I may. Was, what, what were you going to say there? Somebody was about to say, can I ask you guys what was that first? Oh, no, Jaffe. Yeah, just I wanted to just take a take your guys pulse on something. One positive I noticed about returning to the movies, because I was a little bit on the fence. Like, do we really need this type of thing anymore? I want to be supportive because I'm an animator by trade. But honestly, you know, I was kind of sitting on the fence. I could kind of waver both ways. But one thing I did notice, at least around here in suburban Philly, there was like a universal throwing up of the hands when it came to bringing outside snacks into the movies. You know, (laughs) I remember a time not that long ago, like a decade ago, where the usher would go down the aisle with the flashlight and like make sure you didn't have contraband. You know, hmm. now you just go walk in with your Starbucks, you know, and our movie theaters have like full on full service, alcoholic beverages, bars, coffee. Dude, that's what's so great about Alamo. Setup. I get fucking loaded. Oh, those it's, movies. it's magnificent. Holy but shit. now they don't care. And I guess this has to do with just, you know, welcoming people back to the theater and keeping the whole thing alive where they can't really poo poo you bringing it out. It's like, do whatever you want type of thing. But that's one thing I noticed, like you could just go in with your bag of Burger King yeah. <laughs> or whatever you want. And I don't know if you guys notice the same thing. The other thing I always think about with movie snacks is I'm always that idiot. Cause I'm so sensitive to, you know, like growing up in the Northeast, like Colin was saying, like making a racket, disturbing other people. Like I'm always everyone was just telling the- us to shut up all the time. basically. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> get out of the way, be quiet. You know, you should be seen and, and not heard for a living. Now it's I, perfect. I know that it might is. be a direct <laughs> outcome from that but i'm always the guy with the gummy bears or the goobers you know making too much noise with the plastic why aren't there movie proof snacks i'm not even sure what the answer would be that's a great fucking idea right but like they they exist they exist they're they're there's packaging uh that doesn't have to be crumbly crackly (laughs) bullshit it's a milk duds come in a box they're not silent but it's it's better than putting them in some cellophane shit i think it's a great idea I think it's a great idea. Thanks, Definitely. Jaffe. Now Definitely. it's your turn, my friend. Yeah, what oh, did you? Well, no, yeah. I, well okay. Uh, well, on that topic, briefly, yeah. I look. I was a kid of the seventies, and we had this lady who was kind of a babysitter, nanny, whatever, and and she uh, would take us to the movies from time to time. And I remember once. I mean, we literally went to see Roller Boogie, and then we went to see right afterwards. We saw a movie called The Scavenger Hunt, and they were like stupid seventies movies. But anyway. We went to Captain D's, which is like a seafood fast food restaurant before, and she got all kinds of shit. And she like brought a picnic into the movie. And that was just how she went to the movies. And it was like, it was just, it I was what it. was done in the South. Nobody cared. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the theater, you know, I got was, like fish food. Oh, yeah. I didn't like oh, Captain no. D's, but she loved it. But imagine um, the smell for everyone else in the theater. I know. Oh, well, that's like flying food. on an airplane. That's the one time I will say something. Don't bring your fucking tuna melt on a fucking airplane oh, and sit worst. next to me, you son of a bitch. I will throw you out the window. <laughs> I will throw you out the window. <laughs> um, but okay. So, speaking of airports, though, so, you know, here's the one thing I will say seriously, though, about and, you know, People used to do these nice things. They don't need more. People used to be this. They're not anymore. I, I, I think in my opinion, and it's just that uh, it's important to not lay all of that at the feet of the people who are not acting respectful. Uh, because I do think culturally we have trained, not we, but the culture of uh, you know, with businesses and people losing their jobs and layoffs and lack of loyalty from corporations that used to, you know, this, and there used to be a a sense of not a 
socialist safety net, but a sort of morality and friendly and human safety net that I think you could count on. And I think society, you know, capitalist society as it is today, I do think is kind of molded people in a way to say, I have to look out for myself. You know, I could get sued. I could get hurt. Um, I'm tired. I don't have the energy to care about you right now because I could be losing my job tomorrow. You know, I just think there's more pressure on people and it doesn't forgive them for being assholes. But I just think if you only stop at the place where you go, oh yeah, people are just assholes today and you lay the entire burden at their feet. I think that's unfair because if you really want to solve that problem, we have to figure out, you know, how did it start receding in the first place? You know, what, what was the reason? Otherwise you're just like, ah, it was better back in my day. And it was when it comes to that. But if we really want to fix it, I think we have to figure out why it happened to begin with. Yeah, that's a fair, really fair point. And I think an empathetic point, you know, I think about that a lot too. I just, just the very, the general act of parenting and how wildly that's how wild that spectrum is in there. Then you're just projected into the world based on that. I could have been, yeah. I could have been born to a pack of wolves and it would, I, I wouldn't have be this way if I was, you know, I, I, with all the, the foibles, faults and good parts of me that all comes from that upbringing. So I think that's really important. I, I mean, don't know how, but, but your sisters, you said are very different. So yeah, how, they are, how, they, they, how did they, they get away with it? They maintain much more of their New York. I don't know. Um, like our dad is very stoic, but take no bullshit. Like I'd be very afraid to fuck with my dad if I were someone. Um, and uh, a lot of people are, I think. And then I think a lot of that bravado was just taken by my sisters. But the the more stoic, like calmness of my dad, the more new age part of my dad, I think was just taken by my being my brother more. Gotcha. But I think we all have it. I have a right. fucking fuse. I think it's gone. I think it's gotten way longer the older I've gotten. Sure. But I've gone, I've fucking gone off, no doubt. But yeah. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I just, it's just interesting. Yeah, they, they're much more. I would say Dana and Ali, our sisters, are much more honest in some ways than than we are in terms of like how we feel. And I just don't want to multiply my problems by feeling good in the moment. You know, okay. it's too risky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Dig. Let's go over to you, my friend. It's time All for right. your topic. All right. Yeah. So I'll tell you. So I want to talk about bullying, bullies, and I'll leave it to each of you to take it wherever you want. Maybe you want to talk about being a kid and bullying in in your past. Maybe you want to talk about bullying in your adult life, workplace bullying, cyberbullying. So I'll leave it up to you guys. We'll put it on my radar was our 12 year old, Graydon. um, He's kind of dealing with a bully in school. It's been an ongoing saga over the last couple of years, but it's it's not super serious. Um, and he's my my son is an interesting cat because he's not a tough guy, but he's always had a zero tolerance um, for being pushed around. Like I remember him as a, on the playground as a little three, two, three, four year old. And like, if a kid tried to cut him going down the slide, he'd be like, no, like it's, it's my turn. Like he was never afraid to stand up for himself. And I think that's still his nature. So I think he's dealing with it. I'm not sure how much it bothers him. Sometimes he's not a very vocal, um, or extroverted when it comes to conversation. Like he's ready to talk about stuff when he's ready to talk, which I think is typical of a 12 year old boy nowadays. But he's also just not that that demonstrative. Like I don't think that I think he lets things run off his shoulders. He's relatively easygoing, but he has been dealing with this kid for a while. I think the whole group of friends have. He's kind of this bully that he's dealing with is kind of in the group of friends. Like they'll play basketball during recess, and this kid will just commit like heinous fouls, like push people down. And he's very aggressive, this kid. And it's it turns out that my wife who's a teacher in the district. So she's kind of very familiar with the neighbors and different families. She knows the family. She knows the older siblings. And she's like, yeah, that's pretty indicative of this family. They're pretty loud. Um, they're, they're kind of a, a, an obnoxious family, more or less. And he com- kind of comes from that stock. But anyway, my son's dealing with this. And I was kind of examining my own history with bullies, which I've talked about on the show before I've talked about on knockback 
that I had, first of all, which is a hilarious thing for me. I had an elementary school bully who went on to be my friend later in life in high school, but he was a neighborhood kid. He was probably three or four years older than me. So when I was a freshman in high school, ninth grade, he was probably graduating. You know, he was that much older, but he just set his sights on me, right? For really no apparent reason when I was young, probably first grade and he was in like third or fourth grade. And he would just bully me relentlessly and threaten me and I'm not sure if it ever got physical, but he would scare the crap out of me by threatening me on the bus. And he would say, because we got off at the same bus stop, he would tell me, this was a kid, Corey. He would say, I'm going to smash you when we get off the bus. And he was serious, you know, and he put the fear of God in me. But the thing is, he was so dumb that he let me get off the bus first. And I would just run. My bus stop happened to be at my best friend's house. I would just run right in my best friend's house, right in the front door. And his parents were both working, but he had a nanny, Diane. And I would just go, I would just run in. Corey would just, he would chase me. I would feel him on like the, you know, he would be brushing at my back and I would just get in the door. I'd get in real quick. And every day he did the same thing. He said, I would smash you, but he let me get off the bus first. So essentially he was either really dumb or he was toying with me type of thing. But then, so I remembered that as my very first bullying experience and it got so bad. The weird part of that story though. Yeah. Is that if you go back, yeah. there is no record of Corey. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> he was like a phantom bully yeah, type right. of. Yeah. We ended up he was, he was becoming. You. He was a version of you pushing you. <laughs> Corey died in a, in a driving in a yeah. car accident in 1979. That's right. Yeah. My mom talks about this story, which I don't remember when I was in Little League. I was re- it was probably T-ball. I was really young. And I hit my first triple. and. She said the second baseman had the ball in his glove and was chasing me to tag me as I was running from second to third, I guess. And my back was arched as I was running. So that was the only thing keeping me from the tag. So it reminded me of that. Like he was hot on my heels, but I always got away. And really, in retrospect, he was kind of a prototypical 70s, 80s bully, like not the brightest bulb in the in the socket, but He probably was in retrospect toying with me, but I remember later on, I was thinking with, with my son as compared to me and we're very different. Like he, I was much more sort of, I I would bow down to the bully. I I was afraid of everything. I was an erotic kid and this will play into the anxiety topic that we talk about in a little while, but I probably in all honesty dealt with a bully. It seems like at every step of the way. And then I was thinking. I guess in high school, my experiences with bullies sort of dissipated. But then I remembered as a senior in high school, I was still getting bullied. I just remembered this random memory of being on a field trip. There was this kid, Tony, who went on to be like the high school's quarterback and all the girls loved him and everything. But when we were younger in junior high, this kid would bully me. He just picked on me relentlessly. And I remember, I guess, feeling like I was already a skateboarder. I was a senior. I was getting ready ready to graduate high school. We were on some kind of random field trip somewhere. And I think thinking that things were cool with me and Tony now, it had been a few years, like we were growing up, I said some wise ass remark to him while we were eating lunch at this picnic table. And I all I remember is being having the sandwich in both my hands. And being on my back because he pushed me off, but my butt was still on the picnic bench. (laughs) And I remember like, I kind of felt bad for my son because I was like, my bullying never really stopped. Like I was bullied all through school at some point. Like it never really, I guess it never really abated. And I wonder, I kind of want to be a fly on the wall with my son because I want to see how he's handling it. You want to go fuck the kid up? There's a there's a part of me that what, like dad used to tell me, right? We had a tough guy dad. Like the apple fell very far from the tree for me. I was not a tough kid. And he would tell me like you got to kind of haul off and like you if this kid's picking on you and he gets physical, you got to belt him type of thing. And I remember feeling like that sounds like a movie or a comic book. I can never be that dude, you know? And I wonder with my son, I don't want anything to ever get physical because I don't want him to get in trouble because he's inherently a good kid. But I do wonder 
how my wife is much more, um, Helene is much, there's a, there's more of a tough, she's little petite gal, but she's, she has much more of that inner toughness. I think that kind of zero tolerance for bullshit type thing suffers no fools. I would more probably, I'm more of a coward. You know, I was always more of a coward. So I do wonder, you do want to impart that, car, that courage, like this kid's not really going to hurt you. The worst that's going to happen is you get in some schoolyard little fist fight and you know, who you, it's never, that's going to be a really one-off. know that. that anymore. Truth be told. I don't know. So, you know, I know you're, you're probably right though. You're probably you know what I mean? Right. It's yeah. the things you can't imagine when you're 12. It's like, it seems like this catastrophic battle that you're about to enter into. It's never going to end and the problem's never going to abate. But that's the type of thing with bullying that I think of like the dynamic with how now, how is my progeny going to handle the same thing I was uh, dealing with back in the seventies and, and more the eighties. But you know, that's the type of thing I wanted to hand over to you guys. If you have any funny experiences with, with bullies. And then of course, like I remember too, probably about, a decade ago, a specific animation studio, there was a real anti-bullying campaign. I'm not even sure what was going on. This was kind of just at the beginning of the Me Too movement. I think this bullying thing moved right into that. And it did affect the company I was with. But that was always... An, and I think we, my specific team was very insulated and sort of isolated there. So we weren't really dealing with it. But I do remember that workplace bullying thing being like, wow, people are dealing with this as adults in their livelihood. And that was something that, thank God, I couldn't relate to. But if you guys have any experience with that, so take it wherever you may, my friends, and go in any order you want. Dig, I'm, I'm serious. Go, let, let's go rough this kid up. <laughs> <laughs> he's a chaotic, supposedly, <laughs> from what Helene says, he's a pretty chaotic individual. Yeah, like, I imagine. I don't know if it's like an ADHD thing or... If it's aggression filtered down from the older siblings, you know, they're picking on him. So he's picking on the other kids. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I don't even know who he is. I don't even know what he looks like. He's just completely. That's off a my great. Radar. I've, uh, okay, you can have it for free. I've just come up with your company's new show. Here's what it is <laughs> you, you guys go around with a camera crew. Okay. Don't rough up the kid, but confront the parents of bullies. I would watch the shit out of that fucking show. That's a good show. idea. Just to see you guys knock on the door of this kid's family and go, we're not going to hurt your kid. Are you out of your mind? We're grown ass adults. But this is what he's doing. Here's some footage of your kid. Let's have a conversation. It's like that pedophile show. What was it? Uh, with oh, the to, catch John... a to Catch a Predator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a whole yeah, cottage I would watch that. I would watch. Dustin, come on, man. What else are you going to do? Make that show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What else I don't you have doing, anything Dustin? else to do. Let's do it. Can um, you imagine being a parent of a bully? I, I, think I, I, I was going to say that. That's so interesting. You know. That would probably be a worse dynamic than being the parent of somebody being bullied. Because how do you let that go? How do you let your kid you sort of don't recognize her? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good point. I don't know. Well, isn't I mean, it with with bullying? It's it's almost always a, a problem at home. That yes, it's like a parent yes. wouldn't care that their kid's a bully. That's why they're a bully because they don't right. care about what their kid. Yeah, I mean, if, I, if my parents ever caught wind that we were treating someone like that, it would have been game over. I couldn't oh, yeah. even imagine. I think unless you're talking about a kid that's got some kind of, uh, you know, chemical imbalance or something sure. short of that. Yeah. I mean, people aren't, people don't come into society and get raised in society and the natural inclination is to be an asshole. Um, right. I agree I with you think, 100%. Uh, um, Cause Dustin, was it you and I that were having the conversation about are, are people inherently good? Was it you? Yes. And I that were yeah, uh, I think it was on Constellation. Right. And I was saying that I actually agree with you, Jeffy, that I think people are inherently good. I think that situ I think that inertially you'll end up fine. I think that it's things that happen to you that make you better often or worse sometimes. And uh, I can totally relate to that. But I wanted to ask you guys if this relates to or if this if this is um, relevant to any of you, because. I don't know that I was thinking like, was I ever the bully? Was I ever bullied? Right. And I think the, the to me, I would distill it to, I don't think I was bullied or was, or bullied other people, but I was made fun of, which I think is different than bullying. And I wonder, I wonder if you guys think, think that like, I certainly people said mean shit to me, but it wasn't like this consistent badgering, which is, I think what bullying in my opinion is. Mm. And, um, 
And I also think that I've made fun of other people, but I've never bullied them. There are certainly things I reg- there are certainly ways I've treated people, especially in middle and high school that I regret deeply. Not that I don't think it was anything too bad, especially to the way, unfortunately, other people were treating them, but that I didn't do more to be different or that I didn't do more to stand up. Like I remember there was this kid, this like, you know, like the typical fat, smelly kid, basically. And I was like in a couple of classes with him and people were really mean to him, but I just kind of stood around and would laugh sometimes and not really, you know, not really do anything about it. And that's yeah. kind of complicity. I mean, that is complicity and it's wrong. And I think that you do that. I think about that in my heart. I'm like, that was kind of why didn't I, I didn't have any social power. So what was I supposed to do about it? But why did I go along with it? And I, I think about those things sometimes. And so I wanted to ask you guys about that. And then I also wanted to throw out the idea of mean things that people have said to me as an adult have stuck with me way more than mean things people have said to me as a kid. There are a few interactions I've had that I've never even talked about and that are not anything bad about my character, but more about personal looks or things, whatever that I've had over time where I was like that stuck with me every day of my life since then that like that person said that to me more than some kid in high school making fun of me for reading toy fair at the lunch table or something, (laughs) you know, like, like, So I, I wonder if either of those resonate with, you, you know, you guys doesn't Colin, I would say for me, like growing up, I never had the experience of a, a singular bully or a, a repeat incident. And I think partially for me was because I, I would always be willing to dish it back just enough to know not to mess with me. And that's kind of how my dad raised me in a lot of ways. I remember being in like third grade and my dad saying, he's like, hey. If you ever get cornered bathroom or something, you're worried you're going to get beat up. Remember, you got these like like holding out fists and stuff. So I always knew it. it's like that work, get to sucking. What? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what he said. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Got them DSLs. Yeah. Damn. So I would always dish it back just enough. Like, for example, uh, I, I think I may have told this on a show recently is that i would read manga when i was in fifth grade like pretty regularly while i was waiting for the bus and there was this sixth grader kid who wasn't again he wasn't like a regular bully but he would every every once in a while try to make fun of me and he would say stuff like why are you always reading that chinese shit and i would just laugh at him like to his face because it was so stupid what he was saying it's like this clearly you're being ignorant right now it's always dishing it back to some level And it would get more involved as I got older and had closer friends as well. Like we we had a weird relationship because me and my friends were not popular, but known in the school because we were part of the morning announcement program. So everyone knew who we were and we would do stupid shit like play cringy clips and play the Rebecca Black Friday song every Friday for an entire year, like stuff like that, that we thought was hilarious, but would really bother people. And so some of the cool tough guys would would say shit about us or whatever and we would again dish it back but we were getting more creative and more juvenile and i recall one instance where the one guy was trying to like instigate my friend into a fight he's like yeah come at me bro and my friend said yeah well i'll come in you And this guy did not know how to respond and just Dustin, walked away. Just walked Dustin, away. Dustin and pulls his friend aside. It's like, I don't think that's what you meant to say. <laughs> oh, no, that was, but that was the thing is it is exactly what he meant to say. And it totally right. worked because they don't, it's one of those situations where they don't know how to handle the fact that you're not taking them serious to any extent. It's like a total <laughs> disarming situation. So he walked, he just walked away. He was just like, uh, and turned like, around. What the fuck dude. And then I think this might've been in the hallway, uh, like the, this interaction. So yeah. Uh, you should have chased him down the hall. No, I'm serious. Yeah, Get over here. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that though, Colin, you're right in that for me and I wouldn't, I don't know, maybe this doesn't really relate to the topic exactly, but the most painful things that anyone could say to you were the people that you cared about growing uh, up. Oh, yeah. And that, and sometimes it was a friend maybe saying something in jest that they shouldn't have said because it was too, too real. Uh, or maybe it was a friend directly trying to hurt a friend, which unfortunately happens all the time. I mean, that's friends clash and getting fights all the time. And that's an unfortunate reality. And so that was always the thing 
for me growing up, it, it's weird because I was I never felt sensitive to bullies, really. Like maybe it would bother me for a day or two or if someone said something. But if I didn't care about them. Ultimately, it didn't stick with me. I just didn't care what someone who doesn't care about me thinks. But the when I get very sensitive, which I consider myself a sensitive guy overall, it was always from the people that I cared about because it meant a lot more. Yeah, I mean, I will say this and I know it's petty, but when I see or hear about some of the people that were mean to me in high school and I know what they're doing now and what their life has become, I laugh and I <laughs> laugh and I laugh and I laugh. Jaffe, we haven't heard for you in a while. What do you think? I mean, I have so many fucking things to say. Please. This. Um, well, to that point, I mean, I, I enjoy when bullies do poorly as adults as well. But th th there was one bully, and I didn't, it didn't really ever get bullied uh, for the most part. But there was one bully who bullied my friends. We were in the band, and uh, he was just a big, m tough, asshole, ignorant motherfucker. Drove pickup truck, had a black belt in karate had a shotgun in his truck that back in the day you could carry those to school in your truck and all this shit. Um, I remember once he took one of my friends and it, we were coming back from a band trip on the bus and they were going to fight in the parking lot uh, when the football team got dropped off and the band got dropped off different buses. Um, and I, 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 I'll never get it out of my mind. He took this guy's head. Uh, my friend's head and it was cold, it was Alabama cold. So it was like February and it was like 26 degrees out. And he took it and he slammed his head on the concrete oh, no. and you could just hear the squishy, you know, and he was fine. It didn't kill him or obviously anything, but he, he was a grade A dick. And unfortunately he's not like working, you know, shoveling shit on a horse farm. He's a cop now in a small Alabama yeah, town. You. So, <laughs> you, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, that. that's the, that, that's the bully educational to occupational program. But I mean, it, it can go bad, but okay. Uh, and also I have to say, and I am so sorry to be a dick. I know I'm the guest here, but I saw Colin's face and I know it went through Colin's mind when you said he, not Colin, uh, but when, when, when Dagan said he's not the brightest bulb in the socket <laughs> and I'm like, there's only one bulb in a socket. Yeah, yeah. You can't put multiple. And I, I looked yeah. at Colin cause I'm like, he's going to catch that. And I'm like, don't say anything. I was, thinking, I'm like, I, well, I was like, I was thinking about it. Like I had never heard that one. So I was like kind of trying to do the logic and also stay tuned in. So yeah, it was something I noticed. Right. Well, <laughs> right. I could tell. Um, okay. So, uh, um, that'll stick with you. Jeff, he's bullying me. He's Colin. bullying me right in the bully. Um, like, so, Okay, a couple other things. Uh, there was a great, a great Tim Allen movie. That's so contradictory. Uh, there, there was a, there was a Tim Allen movie where he was an adult being bullied at work. I don't remember what this was called, but it was really funny and really good. Where uh, he was being picked on, and he got training to fight the bully at work, and it ended up being a really neat little fucking weird movie. I don't remember the name of it. Show somebody. Um, Probably that sounds about right. Yeah, from and 2001. Was, so I, yeah. Yeah. I recommend, but um, the bully thing that fascinates me the most though is uh, it, it, you know, again, I don't know why as I get older, I, 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 I don't know if I'm, it's not that it's deeper thinking like it's better, but I, I can't just see the surface shit anymore. Right. So the bully situation, especially as you get older, to me, it, it seems there's something about, you know, our whole society, there's like an evolutionary thing, right? Our whole society has become brains over brawn, right? I mean, it's, it's intellectual ability, ability to earn, ability to create. That is the currency of success in this society. But we're only a hair's breadth away from someone who can just pummel the shit out of you still being the one that has the power. And I have to assume being someone that has been born into the body or the ability or what have you, where brawn is sort of, they've rolled an 18 in strength, but like a six in intelligence or whatever. I have to assume that that's there's, I'm not, I'm not forgiving them, but I have to assume that there is some ever going conflict within a person like that to go. I have this thing and I know it works, but I can't use it. And I have no way to compete with 
today's valued currency because I'm not that smart or I'm not that clever. Or I'm not that creative. And so, but I also think people, and I put myself in the camp, I'm not saying I'm super smart and I'm certainly not super strong, but I put myself more in the camp that I've made my way with my brain than with my fists. And there is also, I think, an underlying fear that we can walk around and go, yeah, well, fuck you. My, my ultimate solution is worst case, I'll just sue the fuck out of you or I'll expose you or I'll outsmart you, you know, but end of the day though, you're still susceptible to being knocked out cold by somebody who basically is a lot fucking bigger and tougher than you are. And I think that is under the surface of so many interactions between people, whatever the age that I think it's, it's not resolved, you know? Um, and, and I think that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of this shit that's going on. And I don't, I don't, I don't know how to solve it. I don't know if we eventually evolve out of it. Uh, So that came to mind. And then I will tell you, I was bullied up until third grade. And then I punched the fuck out of the guy. And it is true. It stopped and it never came back. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't even think it was like people in 12th grade were like, dude, Jaffe's got a punch. I saw him when he was six, you know, but I think there was a sense of, once you realize you can potentially win physically, I think that energy carries with you because you have it in your own mind mm. of like, I, I, I can hang in here. I don't know if I'll win, but I'm not going to just collapse in the face of, of physical violence totally. in that easy target. You're you not know. the easy target then. And yeah, then no. It's so funny yeah. you say that Jaffe, because I brought up in the past, like I didn't get into fights until I was in high school and I got in the shit kicked out of me. On, on several occasions, I had never won a fight, but people knew that I would go. I would I would stand up to myself for myself or like if you like there would be a fight, you know, like it's not going to be like you're just going to beat the shit out of me. And I I gave me a little bit of pride. And I think it feeds into what I think you're speaking of, which is the the really complex social dynamics that develop over time that people just you just take things on board about people. Oh, yeah. David Jaffe, like you're in J- David Jaffe's fucking third grade class. And you did see that happen. And you don't think about it ever again. But it's right. just there about David Jaffe. And I think that I try to at least put up like where it's like, I'm not going to like let you jump me or something, which happened once and be like, I'm not. what do you think? I'm going to fucking turtle. I got I got fucking destroyed way worse than if I just gave up. You right, know, right, but right. I think people remembered that. And I don't know. I, I so I totally agree with you there. And you know what I think? I wonder if you guys think what you think about this is if and we can go back and, and uh, sharpen this update if you want to say more. <laughs> is, uh, I think bullying largely goes away as an uh, in adult in the adult world replaced by what I think looks a lot like it, which is clickishness. Mm. Now, like clicks develop in your childhood, too, and you have your friend groups and all of that. But my experience in the games industry, and I think Jaffe would probably feel the same, is it's incredibly clickish and that and those clicks will destroy you. Um, clicks within a team or clicks within the industry? Like industry well, click, within, all, all, all of that. So I've, there were clicks I, within IGN. That. I was part of a click at IGN, no doubt. You know, uh, and then oh, there one are, of the guys who hated you still fucking comes at me on the internet. I don't even know the guy. Oh, I don't even know. He's like, mad at me because I like you. Oh, it could be anyone. I mean, it, it could be. Yeah. That's the that's the point I'm trying to make. That's actually where I was going with it. I'm so glad you brought that up was I think the bullying the the bullying nature of a click in the adult world is is signaling to others that you feel the same way and that's done a lot by putting people down so it's it's kind of for the same reasons as a kid but sadly and more sinisterly it's much more organized and intentional when you're an adult and i've been the victim of that like no doubt about it i'm not saying like oh woe is me i'm just saying that that's true i know you can see it it, the, the bullying online, and I think, Dagan, that's probably where the crescendo of awareness came from, is it's like ruining people's lives. Little little girls and fucking teens and like like the way people talk about each other and all the... And that's why I really do try to limit what we on Long Island would call like, you know, Yenta-like behavior, you know? Um, <laughs> yes. And I really do try to limit that as much as I possibly can because I can only imagine what other people say about me. You know, did you and, see the law that was proposed? The governor signed in Utah today. No, that uh, parental consent has to be given before kids are able to get a social media account, uh, which hmm. I as progressive as I am. I kind of like that. I'm kind of OK with that. Uh, you know, I think there are these corporations making so much money off their tools that are really creating a very sad, mean generation of kids. Yeah, chaos. Into adults. And so. 
I don't think they should be denied social media, but I think the fact that the parent has to be yes or no, I think is a, a step in the right direction. Right. Um, uh, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think it's to the point, Jaffe, I just think chaos is lucrative. Whether you're making it people is. fight each other, people are dying of a pandemic, uh, people hate each other with political parties. That's really lucrative. Um, sports and casting pe- teams against each other in cities against yeah. each other. It's just all Trauma. the chaos yeah. that comes from that. It's just console wars. It's all manifest, you know, because of the money and the and the fear around it. And it's sad. But I think um, I am I will say about adults like I I can't believe some of the people that I see online are real. Like I, I can't either. I can't believe it. Like I can't believe that they actually sign off and then go and have real people in their world. And they're like, mm-hmm. I just said this online. If I if I said some of that stuff, I don't think anyone in my family would even talk to me ever again. Well, do like, you know who the, qu- the quartering is? The quartering yeah, is yeah. Like he's a- like a right wing YouTuber. Right. right. I, he's kind of interestingly kind of started to peel away from the right wing. But oh, okay, I yeah, had I him on my show and mm-hmm. I interviewed him and I said to him because he says, like, he, at least in the past, he said a lot of really offensive stuff, stuff that I found offensive and cruel and whatnot. But I brought him on. I'll talk to anybody. And I like talking to people like that because I'm like, what makes you tick? It's like, are you aware that you're really hurting people? And I said, what about your wife? What does she think about this? And she sa- he said, oh, no, no, no. I go down in the basement and I broadcast. We never talk about my online persona doesn't exist when I'm in the real world. So at least in his huh. case, he's like playing. He's like, it's like, you know, he's as much of that as Gene Simmons is really the demon when he puts on his makeup. <laughs> yeah, interesting. It's like, it, it's so, so maybe a lot of these people are just like, that's where I can let it all out because I feel like shit in my real life and I have no control and no power. Huh. And, it, you know, to me, it always, it's, I hate to be a broken record, but it's, you know, so much, so many of these problems, so many of the reasons that chaos is lucrative mm-hmm. is because uh, our own gardens are not in order because they're designed to not be in order. And we don't know enough often to go. The person I'm really mad at is not the Republican or the person I'm really mad at is not, you know, this, that, or the other. It's the companies that are doing this intentionally to make their money and they don't care. They don't give a fuck, but they ruin your life, but they get to buy their yachts. And I I wish there was more education on that for people. So you could recognize the tactics more often and not fall for them. But what are you going to do? Yep. I agree. The enemy is class. I mean, the, like the, yeah. I, I say that over and over again, I'm a, I'm a stone cold capitalist and I'll tell you that capitalism is run amok. It's yeah. completely destroying people's lives. And, um, it's got to be checked like in a major way because it, it will eat itself. Otherwise it's a beautiful yeah. system. If you regulate it, it works. That's right. if I, you agree, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Hundred percent. So as the rich get richer, and it's like we were saying, chaos is is it, literal chaos, like the war in Ukraine, right? And people don't like when I say it, but like they that perpe- is being perpetuated for by for you know weapons manufacturers to make a lot of money. I don't know. I don't know what else you want me to say about our involvement in that. You know, they when when I see the Secretary of State, I couldn't even believe it. I was listening to the Sunday shows, and China and Russia were meeting, and he said literally. And out, them coming out with a with a ceasefire plan would be unacceptable. And that's when I was like, oh, my God, like you couldn't even say it any more you, fucking specifically. You know, you mean America says a ceasefire plan right. would be unacceptable. Right. Oh, and God. it's like, yeah, 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 I'm sure you feel that way. Raytheon. I'm sure you feel yeah. that way. Halliburton Boeing. Yeah, it's, I'm positive you feel that way because chaos is profitable. If we could just get rid of lobbyists. Um, and, and Citizens United, I think we'd probably be on the right track to writing the ship. I agree. But we can't. Citizens United is one of those things where um, I was totally wrong about that. Because I, when, I, when I passed, I was like, it's not a big deal. It's, I understand what the, argue, the constitutional argument they're making about personhood and all this. And, um, and it's, the reality is, is that money is obliterating the political system. It's got to be reined in and corporations that we haven't we haven't a republic maybe but more like an oligarchy and i that's why i keep trying to tell people like race gender all these things these are distractions that seek to divide and distract you from the real problem which is that a few people have all of the money and power and we have collectively nothing compared to them they yep. spend hand over fist the amounts of money they spend are incalculable to us that's how meaningless we are And And I often wonder about, I don't, you know, it's easy to look at someone like Bobby Kotick and go, 
you're a piece of shit. And I think he is a piece of shit from what I know, uh, allegedly he has said and done. Um, but I wonder if anyone, no matter their best intentions are going to be corrupted by money and power. I don't know anyone who can't escape it because it seems that anybody who gets in those positions, no matter what they say when they're running for office or no matter, no matter, you know, short of Ben and Jerry, who seem to have been able to be consistent throughout the decades, (laughs) most of these people, they go to the dark side and maybe it's just like, dude, that's, that's like, you can't help it. It's, it's wired into our biology and I, I don't understand it, but people seem to fall for it every single fucking time. And once they get to that, what they consider a golden ring, you never see them again. They just become part of the problem. Yeah, I so, agree. I, 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 um, I don't know if you heard it, but it was, I think it was on the very first episode of the show. My topic was billionaires and how mm. uncomfortable I am with it. Like I'm, I do pretty well. I, I'm not complaining about my own position, but the way I do and the way they do are ridiculous, you know, in scale. And I've been really since that episode struggling with because the, the, it's the ultimate to- problem. Like, what would you do with it? And I think I came up with this idea, although it's it's like an idea that's kind of by force. So I don't think it would even it's not constitutional. It'd have to be a lobby force uh, a lobby passed or whatever. But it's like if you accumulate a billion dollars or more in liquid assets, like you have to spend every dollar above it. Like it, it comes in and like you have to it, you can't have it. So there's millions. So like it's not taxed. <laughs> it's them saying, like, give it away, give it to someone, do something with it. Like you can't actually accumulate this much money. I, I think and it should be taxed. I think was it Biden who proposed 25 percent on billionaires? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, but I mean, it's like, you know, you don't make that kind of money on your own, mm-hmm. you know, unless you can extract the services that the taxpayers have given you to allow you to, to generate that wealth then okay, but you can't. And so to act like this tax taxes is, is, is legal theft. It's like, fuck you, motherfucker. It's legal theft. Only if you know, you didn't use the roads, the cops, the energy, all the shit that we provide. Uh, they're just out of their fucking mind. So yeah, billionaires are vulgar. The very nature of having more than a billion dollars is vulgar. Yeah. I, um, I agree with you. I really do. I hate to say it. Cause like, I just, I really do feel like I am a capitalist, but I just don't think you should be allowed to accumulate so much wealth without it being what would you I, I said on the show i wouldn't even i don't even know what i would do with that much money that's why i'd probably just give it all away i, I would assume that i would it's just not give it, a, it can't be about that anymore yeah. it can't be about when you have that kind of money it can't be about dude i'm really trying to get this house it's like no you've you've capped out you've mac you hit the mat level cap it's got nothing to do with that anymore you're playing a totally different psychological mm-hmm. game at that point which you have attributed meaning to the wealth because it brings some kind of satisfaction in your brain that you and I can't really relate to. Um, because it, it's, it's an, you're right. What, what are you going to do with all that money? Fuck you. Uh, I, uh, I, I said this briefly on the show, but I've, it's since I've been thinking about it more and then we can move on because we're getting off topic. I know I'm sorry. Um, although I guess that's the nature of the show is I said, if I had a ton of money, what I would do is I would go in and fix a city and ask for nothing in return. No, don't name anything after me. Don't, and what I even so I, after the show, I was evolving that. And I'm like, if I had a lot of money, what I would make my quest is in the United States, I want to eliminate all blighted buildings because I think what, that that's, what is blighted? What, what is blighted? Like abandoned neighborhoods. You know, like if you go to Detroit, ah, there's a really yeah. great channel people can check out called Charlie Bow on YouTube. And he just drives through no commentary, just drives through blighted neighborhoods all over the country. And it's fucking horrifying. Mm-hmm. And I really think by the very nature of just getting rid of this shit returning this land to the to earth or trying to build new things i think that just gives people such a huge advantage when you go to places like baltimore or and it's just like horrible so i would actually what i would choose to do because i i actually respect that elon musk is like we're going to the fucking moon we're going to mars at least you're doing something i my my initiative i think would be to to get rid of all of the abandoned buildings because it it bothers me that we have just so much blight on the earth half the country looks like fucking the last of us (laughs) <laughs> so you seriously watch these videos. This is the United States. These videos, it it's things you would see in the fucking third world. And so I think that I think people with a lot of money can do a lot of good. I just don't know why they don't want to do that, because that would be so obvious to me. You know, I would I would set everyone I loved up for many generations and still have plenty of money to give away after that. You know, my guess is there's money to be made in telling people what to do with their money. And so, yeah, sure. 
yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I got off the topic, but uh, are we satisfied, Dig, with the, the topic before we move on? You know what? I'll give, leave you guys a few quick parting shots. Please. Um, and then maybe you want to PS the parting shots, but you guys remind me one funny thing is why does the bully never go on to be to like great heights and great success? Like you never hear the bully became head of heart surgery at Johns Hopkins or a Supreme Court justice, but it's got to exist. And I think that would be a very interesting story. That's number one. Number two is I love what you guys are saying about adult bullying, because I really do think it's more subtle and sometimes maybe thereby more insidious, but I do think that adult bullying is really about those cliques that exist in every facet, every profession, every walk of life, right? It's like the whole thing, the whole function of that is to form these groups, kind of curate them, throw up the barrier to entry, make sure those barriers are preserved. And it's all in the name of sort of furthering your own ends, right? kind of profiting off of the chaos, the drama, the bad blood, whatever it is in whatever you do. I mean, you could see it in things like animation. We talk, Colin and I talk about it in like toy collecting, retro game collecting. Like it exists, it probably exists in, you know, knitting, like Dude, there's like sewing a, circles. There's a real know? division in the G.I. Joe fandom between like Facebook G.I. Joe fans and Twitter and IG Twitter yes. fans. Like they hate each other. Like they, they think they're both sides are like totally whacked out. It's hysterical. Like yeah. It, people who erect those, you know, kind of partition off and sort of erect those barriers. I think in any, any given thing, this is the one interesting thing I do want to get your advice on all you guys real quick though, because this is what I think about in taking it back to my son's situation. I do think for right or for wrong and, you know, nostalgia goggles and all that kind of stuff. But I think growing up, you know, I was born in 73 late 70s, early to mid 80s, dealing with bullying, right? I do think in many ways, it was kind of a rite of passage. I don't want to be the old man yelling at clouds type of thing, but I never remember, you know, teachers or um, playground aides intervening. You know, it was kind of like you were kind of on your own, but in this day and age, right, where the idea, the very notion of bullying is on like everybody's radar, right? It's like, PSAs and public campaigns against bullying. You know, we grew up with Woodsy Owl, you know, give a hoot, pick up your trash, don't set fire, forest fires. Now all that money's going to the bullying thing is like, you know, they browbeat it to death. So what's going on that this kid is literally pushing my son down and all the, my son loves basketball. They play three on three at recess. It's not basketball season for him anymore. So this is like his outlet to play. And this kid's just coming over and just body checking fools to the ground. Is and that, no one's okay, saying I, anything. Is that, okay, but is that bullying or is that aggressive basketball? I, I mean, are there things outside of that game mm. where your son experiences bullying from this kid? Yes. He, okay, I think, then, then, then it's a problem. But I, there are people who, you know, uh, play basketball and they're raised to kind of go, that's fucking street ball, motherfucker. Right, right, right. Um, no, that's a fair question, Jaffe. Um, he, I think from what Graydon says... They'll be playing three on three and there's probably like a group of eight of them all together, including this bully. So not everybody's playing all the time, right? They're playing little games of five and then pick up, okay, well, Graydon and, and Cole and whoever, you know, want Frank won, so but they'll play them. So, But this kid will be off on the sideline somewhere doing something, going on the swings and then just run into the game and just, you know, again, like that, that very chaotic, I'm just going to, and he, he does, it's not just physical abuse, it's verbal abuse too. Like he'll make fun of the sub. He's at that age now, right? At, they're at that age where their physical appearance is like becoming a thing, which is kind of cute to witness with the cologne and he's got to have the right gear on and the right shoes to match the shorts and everything. But, and they're still learning how to do it, but you don't browbeat their appearance right now because that's like the worst thing you could do. Yeah. So the verbal abuse is also there, but no one, and you know, we're in a good school district. We're not in some undermanned inner city school district where there's just not enough faculty around. Like, why is nobody seeing well, I, this? I have a total answer for you, but uh, it's two reasons. One, it's yeah. the same reason Colin was one of the few people to get up at the airport and help the lady with the bag. Yeah. Is that, is, is that I think there's a lot of people that see the bullying and they're immediately triggered by their own shit from when they were a kid and mm. they kind of freeze. Right. 
bigger than that is the lawsuit fear. I mean, if I hear one more school go, we have zero tolerance. And it's like, you know what? If you punch my kid and my kid punches your kid back and you want to expel my kid, that's fine. Go fuck yourself. I'll sue the fuck out of you. Because the only reason you have zero tolerance policies is because you as a school are trying to cover your ass when it comes to legal issues. Right. Yes. It has nothing to do with what's right. It's, I think you're I, right. All the cameras in schools these days, you can see what happened. You can see who started the fight. Absolutely. Those kids don't deserve to be expelled. That's a great and, point. And these teachers are put into a situation where it's like, well, I can't do that because the you know the school says i can't take a side or i can't expel this kid who started it if he punched back he's just as complicit it's like go fuck yourself right that's not true your job is to put people out to help the fucking rich make widgets that's really all you're doing there is 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 making cube brats and and worker bees and you don't want to rock the boat and i get it because they're a worker bee themselves but to act like the adults are going to step in you got to be somebody like Colin who's going to pick up the bag at the airport um, or a parent who's just going to show up at the doorstep with the other parent and go, look, here's what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Um, Old school. Yeah. That's, that's what I would say. I think you're right. And you guys are making me laugh too, talking about, because I remember those cats back in school, like the duplicitous ones, like the treacherous ones. Like I remember a specific kid that I never knew if he was going to laugh at my joke or make me the butt of his joke. He was the, for me, he was the most terrifying one because I never knew was what that, I was getting. Was that Dustin's friend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come in you. Fuck. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> that would be cool. Just like a really unsuccessful bully. Like he wants to be a bully. He just can't get the words out. Right. That's or, a great story for a movie. <laughs> I think I was, uh, I was thinking though, like this bully is on the razor's edge of being funny though, because instead of making it physical and making it about a person like he could do a funny move like run into the game and just kick the take the basketball and kick it as far as humanly possible because you know that you and i find that kind of shit funny as hell for some reason dagan and i just find it really funny when you enter a game with a ball and just kick it or just murder it like as far away as (laughs) possible like if you have a baseball like literally just come take the baseball just hit it as far away as possible so that like someone has to go get it yeah, for some reason we just find that funny as hell. So he <laughs> could just do a move. He could just do a move it. like that, and maybe come to our good, come into our good graces. They become best friends. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to move on? Ready. Let's do it. All right, Jeffy. Let's go to you. I know you're undecided. I'm curious to see which of your topic ideas you wanted to well, roll with. Yeah, I had two ideas, but um, I want to. You know what? I'm going to go with deathbed confessions. I'm, I'm going to go with. I've been. Um, and it's not, it's not that the older I get, the more interested I get in death because I'm getting older and closer to death. It's, it's, it's not that I just, I think maybe the older you get, the more people around you, uh, you know, you have the, I'm bringing up this quote, you have the experience of actually having people die. And so I think processing that, like, I don't, I imagine you guys are a little younger than me, so I, I don't know if your parents are still around. Um, but when my dad died a little over 10 years ago, uh, it, it absolutely kind of, you know, it made me start being more fascinated with death. And, 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 and I think seeing him on his deathbed um, and, and, and hearing and seeing some of the things that he experienced or he said he was experiencing being so similar to a lot of other sort of deathbed hospice uh, uh, recollections and stories from hospice workers and things like that. And it's just, there, there's so much there that I'm just, I'm, I, I, I saw a therapist recently uh, to get a refill of medication and she was asking me, how are you doing and all this stuff? And I was just like, you know, I'm not depressed. I'm not sad. I know what that is. I've seen that in my family. It's a, it's a fucking bear. I wish it on no one. I said, I'm not sad or apathetic or anything. I said, I just feel a little disconnected from the, 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 the life experience. I, I, I'm like, I'm more fascinated these days by the mystery and what is happening and what is really fucking going on in the world. And when I start to hear these deathbed confessions or stories, the one, the one before I get to my dad's specifics, I, I know everybody knows the one with Steve Jobs. That could be anything. His last words at the funeral were revealed to be, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. He was seeing something or feeling something or having an epiphany, and that was it. But the one that people don't talk about as much, I just want to read you this because it blows my fucking mind. Roger Ebert, uh, when he died, his wife uh, at the time, 
uh, wrote this after he died, but she said the week before Roger passed, I would see him and he would talk about having visited this other place. I thought he was hallucinating. I thought they were giving him too much medicine, uh, medication. But the day before he passed away, he wrote me a note because remember he couldn't speak. He says, this is all an elaborate hoax. Uh, I asked him, what is a hoax? And he was talking about this world, this place. He said it was all an illusion. I thought he was just confused, but he was not confused. He wasn't visiting heaven, not in the way we think of heaven. He described it as a vastness that you can't even imagine. It was a place where past, present, and future are happening all at once, right? And then that is very, there, there's books on this. There are all kinds of things. And then my dad, when he was hospicing at home, um, the vast majority of people see figures. And sometimes they are, there's a lot of people talking about, oh, it's your long past brother or father and they're coming to take me home and sure enough within 24 hours they're dead uh sometimes it's people they don't know my dad who was not on any medication um when he was hospicing and died at, in, at home was seeing a little girl running around um and he was also seeing something above his bed that just made him so happy and i remember when my sister asked him uh this is like the last day or two of his life she said, daddy, something, something, something interrupting him. And my dad's one of the sweetest guys that ever lived on this planet, as far as I know. And he looked at her, according to her, like she was a fucking monster. It's like kind of how dare you distract me from what I'm seeing and what I'm doing. And his brother who died a year later had the exact same experience. So, I mean, I could go on and on and wow. on. And, 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 and because these are documented, these are documented by you know, real studies. This is not like, you know, the sci-fi network found a doctor in, you know, some fucking podunk town. And, you know, the, the, these are MIT studies and Johns Hopkins studies and uh, hospice nurse studies. Um, and it doesn't mean anything's happening spiritually. I mean, it could all be, you know, the, the, I think it's just fascinating regardless, because like, if you think about it, the place, you know, it could be something as simple as we see these dead people that were part of our lives the part of the brain that stores long-term memory is above the part of the brain that storm stores short-term and people say neurons are, or scientists say neurons are sort of the thing that stores memory or creates a memory by two of them firing together. Mm -hmm. And neurons are affected by gravity. I mean, it's kind of like when a body dies and you shit yourself because all your muscles unclench and you're not even aware you're, you're clenching. It's just sort of part of your body. It could be that the gravity is affecting the neurons and they're kind of sinking below sort of into the hard drive partition space of where short term memory is. And so you're just getting all this, you know, it, it doesn't have to be God or the right. other side or aliens or elf machine shit. But I just it's almost like for me, when I began to explore that and read about that and hear about that so much of normal life now seems boring and I get, I get the idea of going, yeah, but you're here now have the experience. Now you'll figure that out. If there is anything to figure out down the road, it's not that I'm dying to know what happens because I'm afraid. I just think it's an amazing, how, how can we not be obsessing about this 24 seven? Are we in a fucking video game? You know, <laughs> is, is there quantum immortality? What the fuck is happening? So I don't have, I'm just saying that, you know, when Dustin wrote me and said, Hey, you know, the, the goal of the show, which I knew is like, come on board and talk about things you're thinking about lately. I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, I just think it's fascinating. And I don't know if you guys have had any experiences firsthand, secondhand with this kind of thing. Um, again, I'm not saying it's not science. I'm not saying it's not. A lot of people like to be like, oh, it's just a fucking, uh, you know, it's the mind deteriorating, blah, blah, blah. Cool. I'm down with that. But even that, though, is that an evolutionary reason where we created or where we evolved to a point where when we die, is there a reason we don't want to look like we're scared when we're dying? So the brain does this for us. So people watching mm. will not end the human race and go, shit, life is scary. I don't want to have kids like I mean, there's it's so rich, but I don't know. That's what I got, baby. That's good shit, man. I mean, I, I wrote down quite a few things because it's funny you brought up the evolution. That's exactly what I was thinking of, which was and you brought up a totally different angle of it which is like, don't look scared. Don't look like this is bad because it's inexorable. Right. It's happening, right? And I was thinking about it from another perspective, which is like we actively, and we just talked about this recently, I think in some other context, but we don't really think about dying very much compared to how much you think you would. I mean, maybe some people that are unbalanced, very depressed in certain ways, whatever, think about it. But generally speaking, we're not thinking about dying very often. 
And that allows us to be. And right. maybe it could be that uh, the mind wants it to be known that, yeah, it, it's kind of, you kind of go into this other mode where it's not as scary as you think. So don't even worry about it. And you kind of generationally internalize right. this over time, you know? And I think that that's part of it. So I, I think you're right on. I love it. And I'm especially interested in, um, psychedelia in this in, mm -hmm. for this very reason and why I'm I so badly I've done mushrooms and stuff but I really want to do acid and, and some other things to I want to do DMT is what I want to do that's what I want to do yeah like I gotta I gotta I want to do all of it like I really do I'm I because I feel like you you even if the places you're going to aren't really places and even if it's just your mind and your neurons and different things chemicals it's like to your point who gives a shit it's like that's amazing right. that's totally amazing yeah. but dig I, I don't know if you know more details about it our mm. mom died when she was like she when she she's oh, she's alive to this day but when she was 12 years old she had a catastrophic injury and i think she died on the table for several minutes yeah and she claims that she had like an out-of-body experience but do you know the details about it it's like water right and yeah do you know do you remember like some of the details she had yeah she had i know a little bit she had this the typical the prototypical experience that you often hear about where it felt the sensation she felt the sensation of floating on her back, being at some point above her body laying on the operating table or, or the bed. So seeing her herself from like 10 feet above and also the, the prototypical notion of the light, you know, the bright light that she was moving towards as she was floating seemingly on water and, and the sensation of utter peacefulness. And a lack of fear, just comfort and warmth, um, which is crazy to have to experience that and then be able to come back and talk about it. Because everything, everything Jaffe's saying, like what you guys are talking about, like we're all going to experience this on, you know, from the perspective of the bed or the onlooker, you know, the people crowding around the bed or both. And we are kind of oddly. Unless you die in a terrible accident. Right. Well, right. that's you the never, other. You never you know, hear God those forbid. stories, right? Well, that's like, true. Right. Well, you could. Yeah. I think about it's so funny you said because I think about that too, like meeting oblivion, being crushed yes. in like a fucking car crusher. You know, right. it's over. There, there's yeah. nothing happening. You know, anyway. Right. Unless yeah. No. There's, unless there is a genuine soul or separation. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But right. well, right. we don't know. And we're somehow programmed. You're right. Like not. We think about it from time to time, but it's like blinking. Like we're just programmed somehow not. To dwell on it. I mean, I maintain, I, I was laughing when Jaffe came up with this potential topic because I have a deathbed fantasy that I think we talked about oddly on the Metroid episode, right, Kyle? Where, and this was in the spirit of me not wanting my family to be sad or mourn. And also, let's just go the other way with it. Have a little fun. On my deathbed, I go, let's say I'm in the hospital. Countdown timer, you have two minutes to get the fuck out of the building because it's going to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> the old school video game oh, so model. Like, so like the ending of, of Super Metroid. <laughs> it's like you yeah, killed Mother Brain. Now you got two minutes to get out. Like, I, I just love that. Love that. Dude, that's that's Make it I'm like a suicide bomber. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Have a good time. Like a I mean, a company and a euthanasia company and merge them together. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, right. Like that's you, true. It's like vanilla it, sky. This building needs Metroid. to be destroyed. You have a need. You pay into a little bit of the, the construct, the destruction costs, and then they let you be in there. You know. Oh, and I like that. Get out though. You're still gonna die, mm -hmm. but your family gets a million dollars. Okay, so, so you guys are working it out now. You're actually kind of building this thing to make actual You're sense. Really smart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have a few brain cells <laughs> over here firing. But isn't that fascinating, Jaffe? Everything you're saying, like what happened? I'm sorry. To you, when when did your dad pass? Oh, it was it was over 10 years ago. I mean, yeah. and, and my mom died about f six years ago. OK. Um, and it, it was just, um, you know, uh, I mean, obviously it was sad and stuff. And I love my dad and he was a great father. But it, it wasn't like it, a holding on to that. It was like a firsthand experience of getting to experience you know someone going through that i remember sitting by his bed and he says do you see that little girl i'm like dude there is no fucking little girl there and he just started laughing he thought it was hilarious that i couldn't see her um you know and i just i yeah i mean it, it uh it, it's it's like it's like i want to peek behind the curtain the yeah. older i get 
not because I'm afraid, but because I'm f- more and more fascinated. Maybe because I've, you know, I peaked too early. I did a lot of stuff in my life that I was happy with. I checked off a bunch of bucket lists. I did this, I did that. And now I'm like, uh, I don't really want the things most guys my age want. anymore. You know, I, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I want, what happens when you die? I want to talk to people on their deathbeds. You know, I want to take DMT. I want to go on the journey and figure out what the fuck this is all about. I think it's amazing. It's the ultimate mystery. It's so fascinating. Yeah. I'm with you. We did talk about something similar recently where it's fascinating on two fronts. First of all, we're all going to find out the answer eventually, but it's going to be too late to come back and tell anybody. We're all going to find this out. We're going to find out. Is it oblivion? Is what it do you heaven? Think, what do you think it, the event horizon is? You know, like what, right? what like, is, what hap- Wait, what do you see or experience when you can no longer go back? Like right. what is the moment? Because people experience things up to a point and then are pulled out. Right. So like what and is well, that? There's a, lot, there's a lot of studies on that. I mean, there's recent studies to suggest that even lack of brain activity that we thought they're now able to say there, there was a study from a couple of years back that was explaining near death experiences, suggesting that when these people were saying we're having an NDE uh, and it's like, there's no brain activity. Like, well, there is brain activity, but we couldn't measure it. It's happening at a very, you know, very difficult, but now mm. not impossible uh, way to read. So the idea of bringing someone back, I saw, do you ever watch that show on YouTube called Closer to Truth? No, I don't think so. Um, I'll write it down. The guy interviews like uh, scientists, it's all about consciousness and, cool. you know, interesting parts of science. It's really good. It. But he interviewed a, a wonderfully articulate uh, neurosurgeon and he had a brain in his hand. And he was just kind of walking through the brain and it, it really felt like he was talking about a hard drive, you know, in terms of sort of how everything works and it's connected and things like that. And th- the idea that that brain, the body, you know, the body's been gone a long time, but that brain quite probably still has data, just like an old fucking laptop that's in your closet you haven't turned on for 15 years. There's still data there, you know, and the idea that, We've got to be able to do something with that. Maybe it's a thousand years off. Maybe it's 10,000 years off, but how, how do we, how do we get that data from those, those old brains? That sounds so mad scientisty, but I mean, the point being is when you say, is there an event horizon, you can't come back. I'm the more I look into it, I'm starting to go, I don't know if that's a real thing anymore. I mean, often in physics says that past, future, and present, a lot of physicists believe that that's all happening uh, at the same time anyway. Right. So I don't know. And this goes all into like space and and the acceleration of space and how time is treated by space and relativity. Like I I love the whole travel away at speed of light, come back at speed of light, 10,000 years have passed kind of shit. It's like so weird. And and I think that that just speaks to a rule set we just don't quite understand. And I too, Jaffe, am fascinated by what I would call like the digitization of the mind. How, how can you make it into something readable? It's like a file format. What, how can you read it? Can you share it? Can it, can I one day implant what I would look at as a memory into someone else's mind and let let them see what I see? That would theoret, that data is all there. Like it's theoretical, I guess. I mean, there Um, are, I don't know if you saw the study in Tokyo where they were recording dreams. Um, And it sounds sexier than it is, but ultimately they, trained a group of volunteers and MRI machines on certain images. Um, and then they mapped where those images pricked the brain when they thought about them. And so then they had AI take them waking up from a dream and saying, my dream was about X, Y, Z. And the AI was able to go out and create images based on the parts of the brain yeah, that were lighting I up. I saw this. This was on like Frontline or something, right? Or Nova or it something. It was really yeah. weird. Yeah. Man. I, I mean, it's not exactly what you're talking about. Right. You're not taking uh, the information and moving it, but fuck. I, like, because you mean, were saying a thousand years, 10,000 years. Like, I don't think, I, lit- I literally think in our lifetimes, there will be consciousness in digital form. You know, like whether or not we're able oh, to translate that. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. I believe you don't mean that. human consciousness. You mean we'll create. Consciousness. No, I believe that we'll be able to somehow replicate our own consciousness in a oh, digitized form. I would love that. Cause I think Ray Kurzweil says that happens in 2045. I think he stands by that date after all these years, yeah. but, um, and might even be sooner, 
But I just I'm so surprised by how quick, quickly things have happened in my 38 years. And, and you two are older. Dustin's a little younger that I can't even fucking imagine no. what we're going to be all the shit happening with A.I. these yeah, days. Are you crazy. kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Dude, the fake pictures of Donald Trump. And I sent one around to the Sacred Symbols thread yesterday. Uh, yeah. the fake, there's a fake picture of Donald Trump coming out of a Stargate with a machine gun, like in one of the movies. Oh, I think I saw that. And it's that, yeah. fucking perfect. And I'm yeah. like, it was only two years ago that the AI was making all those clunky faces where they couldn't quite do anything. It was like a swirl. And yeah. now it's and now now it's Donald Trump getting arrested by the Secret Service. Like perfect. And it's video. It's it, text to video now. It's fucking insane. Yeah, it's it's wild stuff, man. Uh, Dustin Furman, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you have anything you want to say about this topic? Yeah. So, I mean, man, uh, the thought about the the memories and stuff is wild. The the thought of like pulling someone's memories off someone's brain. Uh, but I think going back to the original aspect about like just thinking about death overall, uh, because honestly, for me, what's a horrifying thing that I as I get older that I think about is that I feel like Neo dodging grief in that no one ever close to me has ever died so far. Uh, like, let's see. Almost all. Well, my three primary grandparents are still alive. My grandpa died before I was born. So that's out of the table. Uh, my great grandma died, but I wasn't really close to her. She was a little further out from my family. Uh, and then so really the, the biggest experience with grief I ever had was when my dog died in seventh grade, right? And so I often sometimes have these moments where I and I think this is a good thing where I'm like, whoa, I am incredibly blessed. I am 29 years old and I have not had to experience this very real, very traumatic human emotion that everyone must experience at some point. So I feel blessed in that way. But at the same time. It, it sometimes feels like a, a it's like a, a clock ticking down. It's like this is eventually going to happen to you. And I think that it, it's funny because talking about our own deaths, I don't think about my own death very often. But I will say that every year I get older, it is something that will pop into my mind a little bit more. And that's kind of the interesting thing right now, talking to you guys who are, as Colin mentioned, I'm I'm younger than all you guys. I'm I'm 29. So it's a, a different perspective for sure. And it's it's funny even to think about, too, because I think that probably a, a, what a lot of people have to deal with, you know, Jaffe, you were talking about your parents dying. And this is a I don't want to jinx anything, of course, but it's funny to think about in my situation. So I know that. Dagan and, and Colin, you know this, but maybe Jaffe, you don't know. My mom had me when she was 16 years old. So I've thought about the fact there's a very real possibility that I can die of natural causes before my mom. Mm. And that we could be in a nursing home together. Like yeah, I'll weird. be 70 and she'll be 86. So in one way, actually, that feels like a big blessing in that we're going to get old together Heather. which is kind yeah. of cool uh unfortunately we're gonna uh, holly and i are gonna need to have some kids or something because someone's gonna need to take care of a whole bandwagon of us <laughs> at the same time but i don't know it's the robots so, will do that <laughs> yeah well, hopefully yeah. yeah we'll get the ai we'll get the robots going that'd be perfect but i guess coming back to the you know the deathbed confession aspect is that i don't know i this is i have not had anyone close to me die i i it's a blessing but again it, it it brings a level of anxiety for sure well i can't I, I can't speak to spouse or children that i can't fathom but oh, i will yeah. tell you i used to be very scared of my parents dying i was like i don't i mm. can't you know because you can't imagine it yeah and then it happens and at least for me of course it was sad uh and i think about my dad all the time um and i dream about my parents all the time and whether those are visitations or just my brain serving up memories, my brain doesn't know. So I kind of sort of get to see them. It, it's not as traumatic as I thought it would be. And I'm grateful for that because it seemed like one of the worst things that could happen. Again, a spouse, 
kids, that's a totally different thing. I don't think you ever oh. recover from that. Yeah. But if you're talking about your parents, I think it, it ends up being okay. Um, it's, it's not, it's not the, the horrible monster you think it is. Um, it hurts, but you get past it. Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it is, it's weird just to think about, I don't know your relationship with your parents and, and the, the death of your parents is, I mean, eventually, inevitably, unless you die first, this is something everyone will have to experience. And it's, it's weird because I'm sure there's some people that have bad relationship with their parents and it's like good riddance, which is oh, yeah. an awful thing i mean it's an unfortunate reality and it's 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 tough but at the same like for me and I, i'm sure from what it sounds like for for you jaffe is it's like the relationship with my parents and for many is one of the most special relationships anyone can ever have in their life these are the people that literally created you and brought you and yes. made you that person so it's uh and you have the subconscious sense that there's always someone to get you if you fall Right. And there is, there is truth in that. And when they're gone, I think part of the grief in the morning and the just sucker punch of it is like, there is not that geographic space anymore to come home to mm. always. I, it's like, yeah, life can suck. I can get divorced. I can always fly back to Alabama, crash on the couch, have my dad make biscuits in the morning and have my mom, you know, talk me through it. That safety net goes away. Mm. And you survive, but it's weird because you've had your whole life to go. I have these training wheels. I don't acknowledge them. I don't think about them all that often, but you have them mm. and then you don't. Um, yeah. And that's, that's weird. It's a weird feeling. Yeah. Mm. I, I must say, I mean, I've, I've expressed it before too. I, I get afraid of expressing it, of tempting fate, but I'm in a similar situation with, uh, with Dustin, although I, my grandparents died, I, I did witness that and I was sad, but I was, uh, I was 12 and like in college when my grandpa and grandma respectively died and my, we weren't close to my dad's side of the family and his mom died when he was 17, I think. So we never knew her, but, uh, yeah, I selfishly, I, I've always felt like I kind of, it's morbid cause I don't have a death wish in any way or anything, but it's like, I kind of want to go before anyone that I truly care about goes. I know that's like, and my mom would always be my mom, very Catholic, you know, a, astonished Italian woman and be like, you know, Oh, that's so selfish, you know? And all that. And I'm like, <laughs> how you know, Madonna me, you know, God forbid. Oh, and you know, and <laughs> not that bad. And, uh, I always internalize that, that like, that's a selfish feeling, but it's still the way I feel. Like I would rather die than watch the people I love die. And that's just feel straight that up grief. how I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and I, I, the permanence is, I think the, the reason that I'm a very, I can imagine death being something more welcoming. If you're truly a person of faith and you really believe it's not, it's not like, you know, Pascal's wager or anything. You're, you really believe that you're going to go to heaven or that there's an afterlife. Then you really don't see death as final and you can kind of deal with that and you can justify that to yourself and compartmentalize those things. I am always one of those people that says like, I'm open to religion and we grew up Catholic and my family still is very Catholic on, on a scale, I think to very devout, to pretty, de you know, to somewhat devout. And, uh, I'm not, I, I didn't even, I refuse to even get confirmed. I just don't really believe in it. And I'm open to believing it. I just can't. And because I can't believe in it and I feel like it, it's over and you just ashes to ashes in a not biblical, but literal sense. It's sad to me to think that you just that existence that that everything that person ever experienced is gone. If mm. they if their stories that they kept to themselves, things that hurt them, all the history of them is and I really feel truly gone. And that's where the sadness comes from, because the, the big problem I have with in this case is and I've expressed it before is like the myopia of heaven. So I go to heaven and all my loved ones are there. So are they like versions of the loved ones I want there? Or are they like compelled to be in my heaven? Does that mean I'm compelled? Like I have people that I don't really want to be in their heaven, but I'm in their heaven. Like, how does this all work? It's and people think it's like a very Larry David sort of semantical thing. And I'm like, no, like no, what are the mechanics of it? How is it going to work? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you trying to find logic in like religious text? Right, exactly. And, oh, and, yeah, oh no. I'm sorry. Yeah. So so to me, it's just it's a non-starter. And in a lot of ways, I appreciate faith. I respect it. I, Your I've parents said, think you're going to hell. I'm not joking. No, my, I mean, da my think dad thinks I'm going to purgatory. Yes. He's, he says that. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. My mom has never said that to me because she's nice, but my dad, <laughs> my dad has, my dad's nice too, but my dad said, like, I, you're going to go to purgatory. Like you're, you're not, I'm not confirmed. So even if I, even if I went to church and stuff like that, I couldn't go to heaven. 
you know, you think about the you can't you can't make the logic work at that point, dude. And I got to ask you a question. It's not you, even in the Bible, so don't even. This get is me a terrible thing to say, but I have to ask. Yeah. Do you respect your dad less because he does not reject such bizarre beliefs? Mm. Um, At an intellectual level, do you go, I love you, I respect you, I'm grateful, but in this case, I'm ashamed of you. How 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 are you a thinking man? Yeah, I, I, to me, it's like because uh, we grew, kind of grew up in that setting is like uh, I I there's a I consider myself culturally Catholic. And I think mm-hmm. Catholicism is a great tradition of art, of sure. learning, philosophy, like purgatory. Jewish, purgatory Jewish comes, is the same thing. Yeah, like purgatory, yeah. I think, comes from like Thomas More or something like that's not a thing that is even in the Bible. And right. so I love that, you know, and Judaism, of course, like all the scholarship and the history and, the, and all that that goes into it. I really love and appreciate that. And so I can respect and understand someone being like, I associate with Roman Catholicism. Mm-hmm. To me, it's where I can't turn off. And I love the tradition, the Latin mass, all that kind of shit. Awesome. I get it. Yeah. But to me, it's just um, I can't go that extra step of really believing it. If for, for instance, if people were like, this is a tradition to garner more of in a Japanese sense of like garnering good luck for the new year, we do a Latin mass. I'd be more into that, you know, right. uh, than like having some communion literally with God. And so, yeah, I look at my dad and I look at other people and. I don't judge them on an intellectual level. I, I, I have to honestly say I don't. What I wonder sometimes is how people so smart because my dad is very smart. Uh, and I'm not saying that just because he's my dad. He's he's a smart. He's a thinking man. I want to understand better how he justifies it. But do people you like think him, he's doing it for your mom or do you think he genuinely believes? it? No, I, well, my, my parent, our parents have been divorced for a long time. Oh, so okay, I, okay. I actually think he found it after they, you know, he grew up Catholic like we did. He's the Irish side. My mom is the Italian side. So he I think he embraced it more when they got divorced and then it became like a big thing. Like my our dad got their marriage annulled uh, in, in the Catholic he, Church. He's like, I've been to hell. It was called marriage. Yeah. I believe in God. Well, dude, I mean, to get to get a Catholic, to get a 20 year Catholic marriage annulled is a really serious thing that requires yeah, a lot of red tape uh, and, you know, a lot of green paper as well. Yeah. Um, and that, and that alone yeah. is ridiculous. No, I know it's, it's, a, it's a form of indulgence. Um, yeah. And so it's and so he takes and I'm not trying to blow. I don't think he gives a fuck. Anyone knows he's remarried, but it's like um, I so I don't I, I wonder, I guess the next step I was getting to with him and others is. He's not sensitive about it. I think he feels like it's sacrilegious to talk about it in a sense, like where. I want to understand like, dad, let's get into the mechanics. Like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. How does this work? And I think to him, he's like, we don't talk about that. Sacred symbols. Plus bring that man on. I would watch that. I would, I would love, I love talking to religious people, not because I want to insult them, but I'm like, I just don't understand. Help me understand. And I I'm with you a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I have one important question about this, especially Roman Catholic. Um, does your mother find the Pope room in Buco de Beppo's is it offensive <laughs> or is it to be celebrated? Because when I go in there yeah. to the Pope room, right. I feel like I'm a fucking Roman Catholic motherfucking badass. Isn't it sad that the Austin, I find it sad that Catholicism is best known for. Buco it's, de Beppos. No, yes, for, Buco, <laughs> for, its, for its ostentatiousness. I think that's I love that. I, I think it's cool. It's, the paintings and the baroqueness and all that shit. That stuff's cool. Like Vatican. I like the Vatican and all that. I think it's cool, but it's not this obsession with vanity is very weird. Like iconography. Mm. It's only orthodoxy really has a similar thing going on. Even a bigger thing with iconography, like with icons and like actual pictures of Jesus and all that kind of shit. But like, right, right. I hate that. It's it, I don't know. I have to look it up. It's something like 400 different churches around the world claim that they have a nail right as their relic or from the cross right, right, or a piece of the cross, which I can't remember the Latin word for, but like a piece of the wood of the cross and all that. Like, it's just so strange. And part of that is that I love the tradition of all of that and the steepness right. of it. But I just wish that it was embraced more as a tradition to say, like, we do I this. Can, I can see that to not bait bad luck. We do this to keep in line with the, the virtues of our past. But not to say remember. like, oh, yeah. hail Jesus, bring me up. To, uh, like that's. I don't know. I just find that strange. But, I'm with you. Yeah. 100%. Um, anything else to say about this topic before we move on or shall we move on? 
everyone says. I mean, I could go for days about all these. Topics. Well, dude, I so love, you, I love the death. I, I just wanted to say, I love that. I love that topic. And I'm going to read more about that. I want to, I wrote down yeah. the closer to no, truth. But I mean, the Catholic stuff, oh, the oh. Catholic, the religious, the religious stuff. I mean, I just oh, yeah, find dude. it, you know, I, I, I don't understand it. And I want to know more about it, not in terms of the religion itself, but about the people who are very smart. My ex father-in-law is a fucking scientist and he's religious. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't understand that. See, that makes but total so, sense to me, at least why? from my side of that, because oftentimes it, well, it depends on how, like, it depends on how you view faith and what's written and how that applies to science. Because I, at least from my side, it's like a lot of times those things line up, uh, but it gets very complicated because there's so many sub ways of thinking like there's young earth and old earth Christians that are not compatible with science at all. But right. I think a lot of things in science would in certain, in certain sects of religion confirm a lot of things. It would confirm possibly the existence of a conscious force that created things. Right. But I don't think it would confirm uh, here the Ten Commandments. Christian or God or whatever. Here, yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, there's a, they're very different. Like, I, my mind is totally agnostic and open to the fact that maybe there was a conscious entity or a computer or an alien or an AI or whatever that said, I want to create this thing called humans. Okay, I don't have any evidence of that, but there's, it makes sense that could have been the case. But when you start saying, and he said this, and this version of God said this, and this version of God chose to ignore humanity for the longest time and choose to come back 2,000 years ago. He didn't think man was worth his rules until 2,000 years. It's just, that's where I start to go, what the fuck are you talking about? Hmm. Yeah, versions of God is something I wouldn't be, that I would, I would also be curious about. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, that's a whole that other sounds complicated. That's a whole other topic in some sense. Like I, I, I say this to Micah often, is that one of the reasons that I, I find it there's some pride in being culturally Catholic is that it is the original Christianity. So it's like Christ's church, literally Jesus Christ's church. Anyone can interpret things however they want from that point. But Peter being the first pope indicates that it's goes back from the very beginning, right? So there is some weird connective tissue to that that I think is is super dope about Catholicism. But that's about as far as it goes for me. And I, I what you're expressing, Jaffe, is is uh, more of a deist like point, you know, um, age of enlightenment point of view, which I, I agree with. I'm open because I used to say I was an atheist, but I'm really not. I, first of all, I think that's preposterous. Saying you're an atheist is actually is right. Is as weird as saying that you believe in God to me, because it's like, how the hell do you know? I agree. Um, yeah. You don't know so. So and I, I wasn't aware of I wasn't self-aware enough for that. It's at most for most of my life. But so I, I became open to the fact that maybe there's some sort of passive God that doesn't even know we exist or some sort of force or some sort of rule set. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's clearly some sort of rule set. So, um, so yeah, to I, me, it makes me very anxious. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> it makes me very good, anxious. Good, good segue. To the, to the <laughs> oh, look at that. Justin. <laughs> very good segue. Um, yeah. this is my topic. Anxiety. Uh, I wanted, this is a big topic and I, I, so I want to make it smaller. I want to just know what your what your what your average level of functionality is as far as anxiety is concerned. Like, how do you feel and how do you grapple with anxiety? I remember knowing someone in San Francisco who said that they just never were anxious, never dealt with anxiety. And that was like totally foreign to me, as in I, I thought that was like alien style shit. I, I couldn't imagine not living a life of some sort of worry and concern. Again, I think as Jaffe had said, born of my childhood in a lot of different ways. A lot of that comes from, but anxiety kind of rules a lot of my life. And I don't think that that that's that way for a lot of people. And so I, I was curious to start the conversation there. And then, I don't know, it's such a big topic. We don't have to go much further with it, but I just wanted to know what's your baseline and how do you feel for, as an example, this morning, as I do every morning, I woke up incredibly anxious. I wake up so anxious in the morning. And I usually have these really angst ridden dreams and then go right into waking up and having an, mm -hmm. an anxious day and I actually feel better the longer I go throughout my day. And it sucks. Like, I hate it. And I wish I could. I don't want anyone to feel it, but I, I sometimes wish people understood it a little bit better because it's it's inexplicable. And I feel bad for people with really paralyzing anxiety. I'm able to do this 
because I'm doing it from home and I don't really, it's not really a huge deal. I'm not, it's not hard work. It's not, it's not toil or anything like that, but that's just what I wanted to throw out there as we close things out. So Dave, what do you think? I'm curious. What is your, uh, what is your baseline of anxiety? You're an anxious person. I think I just think you, you deal with it in different ways. Yeah. I was singing to myself a little Paul Simon. Hello, darkness, mm. my old friend. I think because of my personality, I think a lot of people don't even realize how anxious I am. I think you have to be pretty close to me to realize I'm a pretty anxious dude. I was actually laughing to myself as I jotted down a few notes, but with a small tear. Because I realized that being a worried kid is what really prepared me for being an anxious adult. I, I, I was just kind of cut from this cloth of being like a worry wart. And I am a highly functioning anxious person. Like I sleep like a rock. I eat. I have, an, I have a voracious appetite. Like I, I never have a problem eating. I love to laugh. I love to joke around. But there is that side of me. I have this weird like old Jewish man energy that really kind of this underpinning, right? Especially when I'm feeling particularly content or carefree, I have this other part pulling at me like, no, you need to be worried. There's something to worry about here. You know what I mean? Like you're not free of that anxiety. Like there's stop being so upbeat. There's something to be concerned about. Like I just have that part of my personality. And I think in my, you know, when I was a kid to give you guys some context, I was just very sensitive. I, it wasn't a maturity level because I was certainly the Peter Pan syndrome dude through my 20s, certainly, maybe even still today, you could argue. But I just was very in touch, to, way too in touch with like adult concerns as a kid. Like Our dad was a, a firefighter. I worried about him all the time. I, he was gone for two or three nights on a tour. I worried about my mom being home and that the house was going to get broken into. I was born in the you know early to mid seventies. I worried about nuclear war with with Russia. Like I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders. I was always, I never remember a time where I wasn't worried about something. I've never been medicated for this. I think it is pretty demonstrative to say, like in the early eighties, mom and dad did bring me to a shrink a couple of times, like a child psychiatrist a couple of times because. It was starting to give me stomach aches, you know, just a constant fretting, you know, and I realized in my adult life, you know, what, where I, where my anxiety comes from, the, the biggest source of my anxiety is from not only what I love to do, but what I do for a living, which is being a professional animator. Now, October will mark 25 years for me in this profession. I always knew this is what I wanted to do from when I was four or five years old went to school for it. It was straight sailing right into this. But I realized like uh, my personality is very on the line. Like I'm probably equal parts type B and type A. You know, I have a very carefree, lighthearted, free spirited, come what may sort of attitude, which I think is more of the side I want to invoke. But that butts up against a very organized type A kind of the need for security, a need for certainty. I'm not a gambler by any perspective. So the very sort of up and down lifestyle of a, of an animator, like I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting to get laid off, I'm waiting for the contract to end. I'm waiting for the project to end. And I love doing it for a living. There's nothing else I would really imagine doing, but the lifestyle is not for me. It's just not like I, I, I don't like that sort of, I don't like the uncertainty of it. You know what I mean? It's like, an animator is like being an actor, only we get paid a lot less money. You know what I mean? That's really what it comes down to. And so I've always had that conflict. And I realized as an adult, there are certain things. I could be very much a duck in water. Like the water, the, the, the stress could roll off my shoulders. But when it comes to my profession, it's a great source of anxiety, you know? And I only do it and I'm only so tenacious about it because I really love the act of doing it. But the profession, the business side of it, doing it for a living, for a paycheck is really hard on me. And I, I'm realizing that now. And I say this, you know, half jokingly, but like I'm in a period of my 25 year career. I've been out of work for three months, which is the longest I've ever been out of work. And I have freelance jobs and everything's fine. But 
it's uh, I wake up with that telltale anxiety, like Colin's saying. I wake up with my heart racing. I quickly realize what it's about. Again, I sleep like a rock, oddly enough, you know. But that's that's really what my adult anxiety is really derived from my profession. And just knowing like this profession, doing it for a living, yes. The the constructive physical act of doing it, drawing, animating my passion for the craft, wonderful. This really wasn't the prof- the model of a profession for me though, and I realize that. I just feel like, and I'm always kind of trying to find ways to re you know kind of reinvent myself. And now I'm going to go into CG finally, so I could really kind of tap more into gaming and be a little more marketable, breathe some new life into the profession, teach an old dog new tricks, all of that. But by and by, I realized like that's really where my anxiety comes from. And I'll tell you, for the first time in my life though. The anxiety is getting bad enough where it is starting to lead into periods of depression, which I don't do well with because I'm not used to it. You know what I mean? I'm just not used to feeling down for extended periods of time. By extended periods of time, I could I mean like a day or two. You know, in the past, I'm human. I get depressed. Something bums me out. Better part of a day or an afternoon that I'm kind of, you know, I'm reinvigorated in some way and could find my humor again and everything. Now it's this is a, a new ball game because I think I've been anxious for so long about work that it's. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Chat GPT, please remake Die Hard as a 2D cell animated movie, but replace all the actors with trolls. Okay, sorry. I'm just having. <laughs> it's doing. It's doing something for me. Over there. Okay, back to the conversation. Sorry. <laughs> I, love I have that. to assume. I have to assume that's not helping. <laughs> um, yeah, that's def- yeah, that's definitely not helping. I mean, yeah, and it's always something. And you know, I've been in animation long enough. I work mainly in television, Jaffe. And you know, it's a very cyclical. It's much like video games. It, it's a very cyclical industry. There's highs and lows. There's ebbs and flows. You know, the companies are in and out. You know, there's a there's booms and and there's and there's bubble bursts and all that kind of stuff. So I've rode this wave. Before it's not—it's really nothing new. It's also a particularly bad time for 2D animators. It's not like David's the only person who can't get work, thank God, because maybe I'd be really depressed at that point. But that's for me. That's the one thing I think of other aspects of my life, and I'm I'm able to kind of roll with the punches. You know, I'm able to kind of dodge and and go with the flow, and I could give those things my energy. It's 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 what I do for a living, and maybe this is often the case with people, but it's what I do for a living. That's really the hard, the hardest on me. And it's a battle that I've been fighting for a long time because it really goes against, I think just what kind of person I am, you know, being Colin's always saying to me, like, you're just not, you're just not one to take a gamble. You know what I mean? You're not, that's just not your personality. You know, you want those assurances and, you know, family and mortgage and all that kind of stuff too. But I think I would have been the same way had I, you know, been a single 49 year old in a townhouse. You know, I don't think I would have been any different. I think it's just my nature. So I'll pass it to you guys. Yeah. I just wanted to say it's like your, your risk aversion bothers me by proxy because I just know I'm somewhat risk averse too. I always joke around. I'm a huge football fan. And I always say I'd be like the most conservative play caller in the world. Just fucking run (laughs) on first down. And just like, I like, so I totally get it, but I would be, if I didn't take two major risks, calculated risks in my life and one less calculated than the other and leaving IGN and then leaving kind of funny, I would never be in this position. It's like, true. Whether it's financially, you know, professionally, all those things. I am it, you. I had to put it all on the line. So there's like high risk, high reward. And knowing your talent level, it's just like I feel like you have to just jump at some point if you really want to know or it's always going to gnaw at you. It's very similar to like when I tried to do political commentary for a little while and it's like, I hate this shit. I want to do this. <laughs> But, and, but I knew like I right. would, it, it doesn't gnaw at me anymore. Like my possibilities of getting my PhD, which was what I was originally going to do. Oh, I always think about that. And I'm never going to know because I'm never going to go back down that path ever. The see. worst part yeah. is Please. when people hear you say that, like I've become very attuned to uh, success bias, right? Like when you hear people who have quote made it when their risk have paid off, a lot of times they attribute it to taking the risk, but it may have nothing to do with that. Cause a lot of people hear that and go, Oh, I'm going to fucking take the big risk. Yeah. It's like, well, wait a minute. Taking the risk isn't yes. 
literally it's what caused the success, but that's because he had to do something. But I, I think it's that even adds the anxiety, which is like, don't, don't go online and look at the success stories because what are you going to learn from them? Well, mm. right. I, I totally, mean, I totally agree with you, but I mean, in the sense that I made my own calculations for my very specific permutation of what right, I was in for you. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And leaving IGN was the hardest thing I ever did. I, I actually made me, it made me fucking nauseous because that's all I ever wanted was to be there. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's sure. not the same anymore. And I think my timing and our timing was pretty on point. Um, and I, I respect that in hindsight, leaving kind of funny was totally leaping before I looked and believing in myself. There was no, there was very little calculation done there. It was just, I just, all I knew was I was miserable. I couldn't stand doing what I was doing anymore. And I just needed to do something different. And, but e- even it, that you saying your timing was on point, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if somebody's out there hearing that there's almost it sort of romanticizes or mystifies it a little bit. Whereas the truth of the matter is you being who you are and maybe at the time, Greg being who he was or who you thought he was or whatever, Mm. um, that would have translated into some kind of success regardless of the time. And I think that's something people lose sight of as well. Cause people, it's like, Oh, I got to Sony at exactly the right time when games were transitioning. Right. It's like, you could have put me working at a fucking, you know, uh, uh, department store. And I probably would have been like, let's fucking make the window displays like horror movies. And I was so driven and so excited that something would have happened. So I just, I think, you know, we get all these weird lessons from, from people who aren't capable of processing uh, really what caused their own success or failure. And then that gets historified. That's not a word. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, in 50 years, we're telling the story of Steve Jobs. And it's like, well, you know, you're kind of telling the the simple version of it. And it's I don't know. I just I, I'm real sensitive to that, I guess. No, I, I, I appreciate that because I, I always tell the audience the biggest factor of my success was luck. Um, and I, I, I think just luck, I personally, in my opinion, think luck and timing, unintentional timing. So that's part of luck was a major. I don't believe you, by the way, for whatever it's worth. I don't well, that's hard work and talent. Too. Well, no, no. I always say like I, it was what I said for a few sure. weeks ago on the show. I'm not one of these people that we because we we're talking about specifically. We we're talking about um, what what was that uh, imposter syndrome? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't believe in imposter syndrome. I, be, I mm-hmm. believe I know everything I need to know to be here. I'm good enough to do what I do. I have no imposter syndrome at all. What I factor in into it is just knowing that I'm here in part because of luck and timing. There's just no, right, but you also made a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to make videos every day about the Alamo. Right. 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 I mean, that, that's not luck and timing. That's you having a self-awareness to say, that's not working at the level I need it to work. And I want to pivot to this. Yeah, I mean, that's, I would, I, I don't want you, cause I never really have talked too much about this, but mm. I don't want to you to misunderstand. Like I was the politics stuff was working out. I could have made an enormous amount of money doing that. I was I was offered hundreds of thousands. Well, of I was dollars. saying the I'm talking about the Alamo stuff, the oh, history, oh, stuff. like the history stuff. Yeah, yeah. But but that was all in one thing. It's like one and the same. OK, but to me, it's just like I hated doing it. I just didn't want mm-hmm. to do it. You know, like that was a big thing. Like I, I had a I had a conversation with a major political outlet. That would have paid me hundreds of thousands of dollars a year right after I left kind of funny to come. Work for them, you know, so yeah. it's it's a. Uh, I but and I was like, I just don't want to do this shit. I hate it. But I but the point mm-hmm. is, is that I'm in my own life. I'm glad that I know that because that was a gnawing yeah, thing yeah. that I really thought I wanted. I really thought I wanted it and I didn't want what it. happened. I'm just so curious. Maybe it's a yep. different show. But when you got it, because I know you were like doing with the was it like Dave Rubin and you yeah, were kind of like getting Ro- in those Rubin waters. and Rogan and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 What was it about seeing that world that made you go, oh, yeah, I don't want this. Like, what was Was there a moment where you were able to per- perceive this is not for me? Yeah, it was that there is no lane for. It's hard to put this in words like there's no lane in my mind for fair minded content content. I think that's that makes sense. I So what I was really trying to do was like I'd have an episode talking about how it was really a kind of fucked up that the sh- statues are being destroyed. Can't we figure out a way for museums to take them and mm-hmm. save them and all that kind of stuff. But then I'd have something being like, you know, f- about transgender rights or I'd have something about um, gay pride or whatever, something I'll be m- maybe more left wing. 
And what I realized was I was just get, I was just by doing this, even though it's how I felt, it was gaining enemies across the spectrum and was a really unpleasant way to live. And when I look at some of the people that are firebrands intentionally, so I look at people like the people at Daily Wire or something like that, or the unintentional firebrands. So which I think are also interesting. So like the Lex Friedman's, the Sam Harris's, definitely the Joe Rogan's who I don't think go, I know Joe Rogan personally. I've been on the show twice. Not that I know him very well. He doesn't intend to be, to, to he's just a curious person. So I think yeah. there's the unintentionally, um, you know, dramatic as well in that regard. And uh, I just hated being, you, it takes a certain kind of person that has a thicker kind of skin. And so I realized no amount of money is going to make this a happy situation for me. I'm either going to have to cater to a specific group by, being kind of a grifter or I can continue to do this and be really unpleasant in my daily life or I can just go back to games which is what everyone is asking me to do anyway and so that's what I did you know Um, okay I didn't mean to derail I just it's fascinating that's and I imagine your audience finds it fascinating okay back to anxiety no I love what you guys are saying though because you guys are inspiring me because what you're both saying is that it's organic it's got to be organic you know in a certain way and just honoring yourself and what you want to do and really not worrying about the other you know, ramifications or the outcome. I know they say, you know, do what you love and the, and the money will follow type of thing. So yeah, I'm just trying to be true to that. And, you know, it's funny too. I'll tell you this, the other thing that really bothers me and it shouldn't, I should, I should, I should celebrate this for these other people, but I know dudes and, and gals my age been doing it around the same time, 25, 30 years in the business doesn't bother them. You know what I mean? Some of them are, you know, some of them are single and live in apartments. Some of them have families and houses and mortgages and three, four kids, you know? So it's really kind of, that's really the other, you know, the other thing is like, it's not just about ability. It's not just about talent. It's also about personality and what you're comfortable with. And I, you know, my, my wife, Helene will remind me like, you've been fighting this fight since day one. You graduated in 98 got your first job, you have been waging this war against the model of the business, hoping in spite of everything that's going to change and it's not going to. So you you have something you really want to be doing in animation that you're not pulling the trigger on? I would love to, honestly, Jaffe, like I would honestly love to just be at a place, which is rare. You know, I mean, you know this from video games, but even more so in the animation studio whether it's feature or TV or direct to subscription, whatever. I would love to be at a Pixar, for instance, and just be staffed there and not worry. Are you not able to get to that? Is it just, there's just so time or there is a big, there's a bone of contention for us as a family about moving, but we've always known that we've always known we had to be in the Northeast. I've been, you know, in the Philly burbs and it was always about being near my wife's family. And I have to be within shooting distance to New York because that's primarily where I've worked. So I have to be within commuting distance and we've always made it work. Now, only now are we starting to talk about relocating to a hotbed like Atlanta or Austin or Northern California or Seattle gotcha. or whatever. But now, you know, now the kids are 12 and 16 and there's only a few years left of high school and my daughter's probably going to go to school in Georgia anyway and all these type of things. So that's been one bone of of contention, but really it's more the model of the business. You know, those staff positions don't really exist unless you're at, you know, a, a very special thing like a Pixar that could sort of financially back that sort of model. Or, you know, very rare other specific studios. But even the Cartoon Networks and the Disneys and and the Nickelodeons, like it's project per project. Okay, but then when you say Colin and I are inspiring you, what are are you thinking about with that inspiration that you're like, oh, I'm inspired to do what? Doing my own thing. Doing, creating my own, sort of like Colin and the guys did breaking out of IGN and, and starting kind of funny, or you could say the jo- Collins leap from kind of funny to LSM, similar thing, mm-hmm. taking your, your skill set, your experience, your knowledge, you know, your, your know-how, whatever your talents, hopefully, and bringing that over and just starting your own thing. The only, the thing is that realistically you got to be able to do that. You got to be able to kind of gain that momentum and, and build that head of steam while the paychecks are coming in. I've always really had a hard time with that. 
uh, ju- just fi- I think it's just finding the time. And I honestly, I think it's a little inherent laziness too. And a oh, little bit right. of entitlement. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I get angry. Like, why am I still, I've been, I made my bones for 25 years. Why am I still going through this type of thing? And you know, my wife will be well, that yeah, voice I've heard you twice say, yeah. Um, and, and not in a mean way or anything, but yeah. you've twice described other people who don't have the mortgages, but have the apartments. Right. Almost as if that's like a negative to you. Right. And I can tell you when I left video games, yeah. I sold my house. Mm-hmm. I always wanted a house. I, I hated it. I have ADD. The thing I probably lost, I gained, I got a lot of money for it, but I could have gotten a lot more if I was a good homeowner, but I'm fucking ADD. I'm like, Oh, the pipes burst. And we'll just use the upstairs bathroom. I don't care. I didn't, it was too much work to fix it. You know, I don't care. Um, but I, I sold all that and I, I, I moved into an apartment because I was like, you know what? It's not cheaper. Trust me. My, my fucking rent is probably more than your mortgage. I've seen that um, by Collins. Not because cool. I live in a fancy place, but because I live in San Diego. Okay. Um, right. Um, and so, I mean, it's, re- I'll just fucking tell you, I'm paying every month, I'm paying uh, $3,500. Yeah, this is more than my mortgage. Um, yeah, you a know, lot more. Um, to live in a fucking apartment. But when something breaks, I, I send an email, I'm done with it. And more importantly, it gives me more time with that money that I made and other ways I made money to focus on my own shit and not worry about running out of runway because you know, it's going to take me time if I can ever build what I do into an actual new career. Sure. And so the freedom that comes with sort of throwing off those shackles of societal expectations of, I need the house. I need this. I need that. Um, and not everybody wants to do that and everybody can do that, but, uh, boy, I'm so grateful that, cause I used to work at Sony and it was like, you know, somebody could wake up in Japan and make a decision for whatever reason. And that was my job. And, you know, it's ridiculous to live that way. Sure. And the companies don't have loyalty to you. And I think that does drive anxiety that, 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 that the kids coming up today, you know, they don't have that fake safety net our generation had, which is like, Hey, you like, even at Pixar would would not surprise me to turn on the news tomorrow and go, Oh, they laid off 40% of their workforce. Cause it's, you know, Nobody's immune. So, you're right. I mean, no. you're absolutely right. So the only real, the only thing I ever heard is the only guarantee that you have is the ability to fly by the seat of your pants. And I thought that was a great quote. And I think it's true. And once you kind of make peace with it, it does lessen the anxiety a bit. Yeah. yeah. For, it's so funny. Cause like the way, one thing I wanted to say, and we haven't heard from you, Dustin. So let's, we'll tap you next is, uh, I, my, I've learned I'm 38. So I've been this way my whole life and I have learned to deal with it. And I've been aided by meds over, over time and all of this as well, especially with my anxiety and my low, like underlying depression, which is what's manifesting the anxiety. And, uh, but it's funny because I've just figured out that I have to take care of certain things to mitigate the, the anxiety. And one of the things I have to take care of or try to take care of is just making it basically minimal to non-existent the amount of money I have to spend to live. So that's like why I bought a house and then put half down on it. Right. That's what, and then I, and then I got a 30 year mortgage, which I'm going to pay off probably soon just because the rates were good. Right. It's why I bought solar panels, not rented them or leased them, bought them. Right. And, and now have no power bill. It's like, I do these things over and over again, make investments. And I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. But the point is, is that I am able to manage it like living in an apartment, which I did for many years, nothing wrong with it. That would, that, that adds points to the anxiety because it's like now I have this, I'm in hock to someone as opposed to now it's like, I don't have to worry about that. I just, ha- I can just live here at, no matter what, hopefully, you know, I, it's like I, I own it. And that for my own kind of anxiety, which is like a more existential dread, I guess, really lets me manage it. And I'm thankful for that because there are, there, those are positive remedies as opposed to it being like, oh, I need to drink every day or I need to, which, you know, is sad, but, and people deal with it, but I, I don't mm. have that predilection. You know, my predilection is to be like, oh, save too much money. Be too conservative with your money. Do, don't buy nice things. Don't go anywhere. Like, but you're buying freedom. Right. I did, you know, right. Exactly. That's the most important thing you can buy and, mm. is the freedom to tell a company to go fuck yourself. This is my life. I get one shot. And, Th- that makes all the difference and you're right it's a privileged position but if you can work towards it don't fucking work for a company right no i, I agree your own shit. And, and i do yeah. say that like i and i i try to give people positive financial advice especially that 
you have to be smart or you'll never be in a position to do anything cool. You know, like yeah. I always say, like say, I say no all the time. I, I say no more than you say yes. And you'll be OK with your money. But that's a whole nother a whole nother topic. And it is a point of of privilege, no doubt. But I made a lot of sacrifices. I could have very easily blew all the money or lived high on the hog. I've always lived below my means and wear the same fucking clothes I've been wearing for years. And like, I don't give a shit, you know, um, there's that. But what is that book called? The, um, someone told me to read this. It was like it's about it's like called the millionaire next door or something like that. Have you ever heard of it? Oh, I've heard that. Yeah. I, I've heard that. And I've heard rich dad, poor dad. Right. And all, oh, that's all a good those book. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I got to really get, look into some of those about like the, the, the kind of mentality, like who, the, but what you're saying yeah. is exactly the same mentality I have, which is, I mean, again, material things are mostly useless. Uh, unless you're talking about your microphone or, or, you know, you have your drum set cause it brings you joy and all that stuff. But so much stuff that we're conditioned to buy is fucking stupid. I mean, I have a TV out there in the living room, which is a big TV. It's probably 10 years old. People are like, get a new TV. I'm like, I don't want to. Because if I buy a new TV, that's money out of my account that's giving me more runway. That's like a little bit of my runway. I don't want my runway fucked with. It's really but, smart. You know, um, it's, it, it, but it's born out of fear, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? In a good way. Oh, uh, it's totally. Like, it, it, yeah. M- Micah has analyze the shit out of it to such an accurate degree that my fiance for people that don't know her where she's like it's just born out of your parents divorce like 100 most success mm-hmm. most success is i mean will smith is now kind of a pariah but it was really fascinating to hear will smith talk about he's like dude all of my success all of my hard work all of my ethic was because my dad divorced my mom mm. and i never wanted to have that feeling of the ground being pulled out from under me again I mean, it's, you know, that's why it's kind of comical. I appreciate it when people sort of turn their backs on people who have made creative products that then they reveal a side of themselves they don't like. Mm. It's like, okay, but you, you can, but you rarely get one without the other. I mean, you don't have to be a fucking sexual assault person to be creative, but you're not, if you're creating or you're working hard or you're bucking the system, it's because you're broken a little bit because the system has fucked you. And I think that's normal i think it's good yeah dustin yeah what do you have to say i'm sorry we haven't heard from you in a while no it's okay i've been enjoying listening and just taking in um for me with anxiety it's it's very odd and i've i've self-analyzed myself for a long time about this because i've gone through periods where i i identify as, a, as an anxious person and then other times where I'm like, I'm good. And during those times, even what's weird is that I feel like I've always been hot or cold on being stressed. And I think that's it's it's weird for me specifically in that. I feel like I am the the perfect or I guess the worst mix of my parents in that my dad is this super confident, maybe to his own detriment guy that that can you know exudes this confidence whether it's in what he's doing or or in or in social situations my mom is the exact opposite full of uh anxiety social anxiety full of self-doubt and so i find myself like ping-ponging between these two positions basically my my whole life and the thing about anxiety and i think right now particularly in my life i'm in the best place that I've been with it is that I've learned and I'm not always perfect at this to take my anxiety and use it to my own benefit. And I'm lucky that I'm in a position where my anxiety isn't where I can do that. It's not overwhelming that I can use it to my advantage. And so what I mean by that is that I feel like I first started to be get really anxious when I was in my early 20s when real life hits and you start to feel not content with what you're doing. And that's where I was, where I was in video production, making a a small amount, not the, uh, and it wasn't that my boss wasn't paying me very well or anything. It's just there wasn't the hours for me and wanting to do something else. And so you you decide you want to do that. You want to get into content or whatever. And 
making it i don't know for me it was always weird because it's like you tell people that you're trying to do something and then you're always worried like well what if i never do it am i gonna look like a fucking idiot and so for me it was basically like from 2013 or 14 to 2018 this increasing anxiety of well what if this is just your life now what if your life is filming dance recitals what if your life is doing this thing that you don't really like because i you see people that settle into something that pays the bills but they don't enjoy and then that just becomes their life and sometimes that's okay your job doesn't need to be the most fulfilling thing in your life i think that's something that isn't said enough it's like you don't if you are content doing a nine to five and then you come home and that you find your fulfillment in your in your family or your hobbies or whatever that's great i'm I'm envious of people like that because I don't think I could be that way. So with that, once transitioning into being, being able to do something that I really love, which is this, that's where I'm talking about my anxiety being my edge is that it, it helped me to not, well, I shouldn't say not make mistakes, but make less mistakes and really think carefully about all the moves I was making, the type of work I was doing, how I was presenting myself because I always had that anxiety of like, okay, you've, you've gotten here. Do not fuck it up under any circumstance or else you are going to regret it for the rest of your life. So, and it's funny too, because I, uh, towards the tail end, and I think I've maybe briefly mentioned this on a show before, but I was having anxiety about going to work at my old job. And it wasn't that that job was stressful. It was the simply being there was stressful (laughs) to me. And so I had started taking a supplement, which is, it's a drug it's, but it's, it's called a supplement called Kratom. Have any of you guys heard of Kratom before? No. No. So Kratom got a war. (laughs) uh, Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Kratos is Kratom. Dude, that's a brand. So Kratom is legal. I, I believe in all 50 states, but it is a anxiety relieving supplement that you can take that really fucking works. But here's the thing with it is that you can take it for anxiety. You can take it for pain management. You can also take it to get off of opioids because it stimulates the same part of your brain. And so while you're not going to be like, uh, put into a hospital if you get addicted to it you totally can get addicted to it and i was at that point where i was taking this and going to work because it made me feel positive about my outlook on doing that but as i started to take it it suddenly was like as soon as it wears off you're like oh no i hate this and so you would like take more and then it's like that cycle of addiction and so that was a really weird part of my life because i eventually it was actually during the covid lockdown that I was like, I got to, this is, it's not killing me or anything, but I don't like being a slave to this and thinking about, okay, when, do, when am I going to take Kratom again? Um, and so I, I kicked that, which was not, it, it was overall pretty easy for me. I don't know if I really have an addictive personality outside of there was a physical addiction to that, but that really switching back off of that was a very very stressful time where it was it was hard you just kind of got to resettle in with reality and so now what's been nice about work because i i would say that most of my anxiety now like i said i'm at the best point ever where i don't feel anxiety all the time i i feel like i can feel anxiety when it's appropriate and then i can use that to try to do my best in that moment. So right now I'm in a good position because I've been doing this long enough that I don't need to second guess myself constantly. I still second guess myself quite a bit. I don't think that's ever going to be a, a, uh, that's, that's always going to be a part of my personality is that that second guessing, is this the right thing? Uh, And it's not even impossible. I have to, I have to ask because I'm fascinated. Yeah. How Please. much of you choosing to say that last part, I'm not second guessing myself anymore, but I'll always have that is true. And how much are you saying that because Colin's your boss and you don't want him to think that you could ever get to a point that as you deal with this, you're slacking. 
I think Colin, Colin, and I think understand each other pretty well at this I'm, point. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making accusatory. No. I'm, I'm asking because <laughs> even that would be a form of anxiety, which is like, well, I need to kind of frame this in a way. Okay. I th- well, I think that Colin understands me, and that he understands that I uh, am a second guesser, and I overanalyze things and stuff like that. Maybe to his detriment in some situations, but in other situations, I can see things for, in a way that he wouldn't and so i don't know i i, I don't know if Ooh, colin has any yeah. comment but no i just, no, no, I've, just I've, I've, I've learned to just to kind of defer to you we disagree on things i don't i don't think i i don't even feel like i have full control over my company in some ways but that's kind of the way i've for, formulated it like giving enough other people other like the power to make these decisions and i i, I for what it's worth i feel like i tell my guys like we're pretty maxed out as far as like we don't really need anyone else to, to work for us as far as to get things done but that I want the people that do work for us to work as little as possible. I tell them that. I've heard yeah. you say that. I thought that I, I listened to your Patreon thing. That was really interesting. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I like I cool. would love for people. To, I don't I think raw hours worked is just a really bad. It's just stupid. I I worked a corporate job when I was at IGN. I wasted a shit ton of time being at my desk when I didn't really have to be there. Didn't affect my job at all. I was just dicking around. I, I remember uh, I would be. There were days where every year where I was, I'm in a very still to this day, a very serious fantasy football league with my uncle and his friends and they draft on the phone and they draft actually in person. So I'd be on the phone all day, like doing that on those on that day. No one would have any idea what the fuck I was doing, but it was like my job. But I was also the highest read author there by a fucking mile. And I didn't need to put 40, 40 hours a week into doing that. Sometimes it would be more, but a lot of times it would be less. So I just try to tell my guys. And it was coming back to what I was going to say about my own anxiety is I have deep anxiety about being a leader. It's like one of the things that I don't want. I never wanted. I, I will be, I'd lie if I said sometimes I didn't want to just turn this thing off, you know? Um, Cause it's, there are times where I'm like, I don't, I never, I didn't anticipate it becoming this big. And I don't mean from an audience perspective, which is awesome, but it, a lot of people rely on it, you know, um, like for their, their income full-time income, right. supplemental income. It's like a big part of their income, most of their income. And I really internalize that. And I don't think anyone that works for me really knows like that I do that or what it's like, because gotcha. it's one of the reasons why I stopped posting on Twitter was not only how aggravating and parasocial it became, but it's like everything I say can, can ruin or create new opportunities or just ruin the company. And it's not, it's not just me anymore. Right. It's the same reason why I renamed it to begin with. And it wasn't Colin's last stand anymore. So I, I, I was just like, I'm removing myself from an unhappy and annoying situation of just dealing with this parasocial bullshit. And I don't have to deal with the anxiety of every time I publish something. It's kind of like when I would put up a review at IGN and then I would wait to see like how angry it made everyone. And like, that was just a thing that you had to deal part with. Part of it. And you're right. Exactly. So part of my low lying anxiety these days is like, well, I have like a lot of people relying on me and. People obviously enjoy the content, which is awesome, but it's stressful. And I don't think I'm a natural leader. I think I'm a very reluctant leader. And I think part of my mantra of work as little as possible here, I try to treat everyone well financially, give them bonuses, do all the rest to just keep the peace in a lot of different ways so that we're all happy, that we never even broach the unhappy Colin at IGN, Colin at kind of funny situations or whatever, where everyone is just, it's good. And I hope that that reads to my people, you know? I trust them. I don't ask them for anything. I can go a long time without talking to the Dukes about their show at all. I've never listened to it. You know, like I don't want to listen to it. I, You've never listened nope, to I it? I don't want to know mm. anything about it. I don't want it to be. I want it to. Be, I want to trust them completely and I don't want to absorb anything that's being done on the show. I want it to be. I don't want it to be sacred symbols and I don't want any of their show in, my, in our show either. Mm. And so, yeah, I don't even, I trust that it's edited every week. People listen to it. They vet it. And I trust that everything is happening. And I try to keep myself mm. very narrow. I don't listen to any gaming content that has to do with PlayStation or things. I play role-playing games. The only gaming content I listen to is like summoning salt and really <laughs> old games or PC games, which I don't give a fuck about, but I, I stay away from anything that has to do with like our field. Cause I just, I don't want to absorb it's like Jim Ryan, right? He knows nothing about video games at all. That kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> no, uh, I play games, you know, so I know, and, I know. you do. I know. <laughs> and uh, by the way, it, yeah. I, Dustin, I would just so you know, I was genuinely curious. I wasn't like taking no. a shot or trying to put you on the spot. I just find that kind of fascinating. I, I never know 
I always want to know what's happening underneath the surface of the brain consciousness. It's just interesting to me. That's all. I wasn't yeah. trying to put you on the spot. No, I, actually, I, I was trying to put you on the spot. I don't like that I was, but it was more important to me to satisfy my own curiosity than your lack of comfort. <laughs> so sure, let's, sure. Just be, let's just be honest about I it. I like your honesty. Yeah. No, the yeah. thing for me is that this job has evolved in so many ways that has brought different anxieties that eventually I've just worked through, whether it's doing the job at all, getting more responsibilities and then becoming a, a more, you know, someone who's on mic. And how well how, then it's like, OK, well, how's the audience going to perceive me, which then it becomes a whole different thing. But right, I've right, grown right. very comfortable at this point. I mean, there's still going to be idiots that say something to you that that bothers you a little bit. But overall, it's uh, I, it's really settled out at this point. And I feel I feel good about it. Well, I also did. For, I'm, oh, I'm slowly sorry, I'm getting better. No, no, I was just saying, I'm, I'm slowly getting better at ignoring the idiots. I used to feel like a real like, oh, let's fight. You know, I enjoyed yeah. that. And then when I finally, it finally became clear to me that I was hurting my content because I thought the audience liked it and some of them do, but I, you know, and I like fights, I like conflicts and I like battles with words and all that shit. But ultimately that's not why people showed up. They showed up because they wanted to talk games mm -hmm. or game creation or game design. And I was like, okay, I get it now. But it took me a long time to sort of go, that's you know that's that's like the mad max thing right that's bait it's like leave that alone that's that won't serve you in right. your goal but totally I, so i hear you it's so funny yeah. we all have to learn that too like I, I i learned that it took years it's only easy to see it in hindsight that you that it's detrimental to you and i, I it's like everything in balance all the arguments and conversation happen on this show now or on on sacred symbols plus or wherever it's going to be right. in front of a microphone with no time limit no edits Otherwise, I'm not interested in doing that kind of stuff anymore. And people can come to me if they're interested in that. But one of the things, and you'll appreciate this, Jaffe, that I've, I tried to do for Dustin and who knows what happens. I mean, the business can go south one day and things change. But right. I know the kind of person Dustin is. And I know how I felt when I was at IGN that I never got laid off, obviously, and I got promoted and all of that. But I was always afraid of the other shoe dropping. And mm -hmm. that's what that's why I worked so hard. That's why I was a slave, basically, to that company. And I, they didn't ask me to do that. I did that, you know, because I felt like it was necessary to stay there. But I told him a long time ago, I'm like, you're not I'm never going to fire you like you're not fi like you would have to you would have to fuck up so badly that we would have no choice but to fire you. In fact, the company right. probably wouldn't even really function, actually. And I tried to put that confidence in him because no one did that for me. No one said to me, right. I, I knew IGN PlayStation was going to suck when I left and it did. But no one said to me, like, we really need you to stay here and we appreciate you. We know what you do for this place and all that. No one said that ever. You know, that's horrible. And I, I, I got that at my job in a good way. And it's it. I'll never forget those one or two times uh, a mentor or a boss came up and literally just said, hey, I really appreciate you. You know, you make my job easier. You make my success easier. Um, I'm with you 100 percent. I'm glad you're doing that for. People. Yeah, I just think that yeah. like he's the only person I can afford. Like, well, we have other employees, but he was the first employee and the person that's chorus to most core to the course, most core to the to the operation. But I think it was important to do that because I knew it's like more, at least it's like 5% more unleashed Dustin now or something. I don't know, but it's, but it's like something it, it, that must mean something because if we are simpatico in that way, which I think we were, then I know that that was always in the back of my mind. That was right. always why I was there on Saturdays. That was always why I was putting in the hours and always even pretending to do shit and yeah. saying yes all the time and all that. And I just try to tell my people that's not necessary. There are times yeah, where we're going to also work, help. Yeah. It also helps so that Dustin's a junkie and you can kind of dangle the drugs right, and say, exactly. well, <laughs> no more Kratos for you, bitch. Right. If you yeah, don't exactly. do what I want you to. That's exactly right. He's easy to manipulate. Um, well, well, of course, yeah. that's the it, best. It's funny, Colin, thinking about it, because I it absolutely did when you told me that give me a sense of of freedom. And I think it I don't know. I, I think it does work to your benefit because in some way that it adds a different type of pressure because. I respect you. I respect this company. I respect our audience. And so it's like, yeah, it's cool that I there's a, a sense of freedom from that. But I also am like, man, I cannot let anybody down. Ever like I've been I've been given too great a gift to let anybody down at this point, which I think is a I would much rather be in that situation than be worried constantly about not being able, like not having a job. I think it's a good thing. 
overall. Maybe I, I painted it the wrong way. I think people just need to be better to their employees generally. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back because I'm not. There's people that are but there are people that are in the games industry that are going to four day weeks that are going to even three day weeks. And I, I just I don't think you have to. I just I just don't like bastardized capitalism that pretends that creativity comes out of hours worked as if you're pushing papers. It makes no sense. That's not where creativity comes from. I wrote the entire game. I mean, at least the treatment for the game that we're working on now in five days. And I don't even think I've even looked at it since they've been making the game for over a year. It's like, here you go. I got all of that done. It's not to say it's the best or whatever. We have other people fleshing it out, but it's to say I didn't need to to spend six months writing it. I got it done. And um, and I wanted to say quick before we exit, one of the things I, I, I read the red, I read a lot of different reddits. I'm not even logged in when I read Reddit, but I just I'm on the app and I like to go to the different ones that I like to enjoy. One of them is anti work. I don't know if you guys ever read that one, but it's um, it's like a very left wing and anti capitalist, anti work kind of place. But there's a lot of really sad. And I think sobering stories about how fucking much people hate their jobs. And this is something that was brought up earlier and how much anxiety it just drives into people and it ruins their lives and one thing i try to remember no matter how depressed sad or anxious i become or am is that i have been really lucky in my own life and i mean it from the bottom of my heart that like i worked real jobs i worked at a deli i worked landscaping and did all this and i worked trash pickup and all this stupid shit that was horrible and i can imagine that you don't want to do that if you do some jobs like that. And I try, so I try to like keep everything into, it's like I, you were asking about my therapist earlier, Jaffe. It's like, I told my therapist my first session with him when I saw this new one, we were talking about my, my history and he was talking about the, you know, suicidal thoughts and stuff. And I'm like, the honest answer is, is I've never been suicidal. Never. I've been deeply sad all my life, but it's never been to the point where um, I've wanted to, to remove myself from the planet primarily because I always understood and I maybe it was for my parents always an instilling it in me understanding that I was a pretty sad person that like it could always be so much worse and I try to keep that <laughs> I try to keep that in mind like yeah. um, and I think that that lessens my anxiety as well and I think that that's a useful tool like a productive and positive tool for me as well because the reality is is that I want to like crawl up into a ball half the time in my entire in my life like constantly and I just I just know that there are things I have to take care of I have to take care of the company I have to people rely on me and so on and so forth so um, so yeah, I have those thoughts sometimes of being like, what would it be like to just not do this anymore? And then I realized that would be even more ang anxiety in your life. <laughs> so you should probably not consider that. And then, and then, um, yeah, but we actually already know exactly what it's like if you stop doing it. There's nothing. What do you mean? Never mind. So <laughs> never, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, if you want, I can send you a link to a, you know, a website if you want to see what it looks like when you walk away and stop doing <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, and I don't um, it's it's one of those woe is me sort of situations sometimes because it really is a fortuitous thing. But I hope you know what I think about it as, as I go out about anxiety. I just wanted to talk about this as a specific form of anxiety. I can't imagine I I, I love sports. And sometimes players get the yips, right? And they just cannot perform. Especially kickers and and certain pitchers. And uh, I just can't even imagine the level of anxiety that must exist. You are a closer in the MLB. It's yeah. three, two, you're up, you're away. Two outs, man on second, right? The crowd is going nuts. It's like, what? Like, that's like a whole can, other I can, level. I, like, I, have an, I have an answer yeah. to that, by the way, um, about anxiety when it comes to that. But... First, I have to say you have to add now the MLB shot clock. Oh, yeah. The and they have the clock, clock, right? That's right. I saw something the other day from one of their spring training games where I didn't even understand it at first. It was like the bases were loaded. The teams were tied. Um, the pitcher got the ball off one time, but the batter was strike was struck out because he was a little bit outside of the box. Because if you're not actually in the box, when the pitch leaves or if you're, it was just some oh. new rule. And the whole audience was like, are you fucking kidding me? Tie game bases loaded final, well, possible final round uh, inning. And, and then even the referee or the umpire is like looking at the camera going, Hey, I agree. I'm just following the fucking new <laughs> rules, motherfucker. But you no, know, you know, I, I wanted to say briefly about anxiety. I know we're going long. No, it's, okay. it's all good. Um, we can go as long as we want. So anxiety certainly uh, just a couple of very fast things medical anxiety 
And situational anxiety, I think it's important to be aware that they can be two different things. And so sometimes people, you're not going to think your way out of it. You're not going to work your way out of it. There, there is value uh, in talking to doctors about possible, you know, uh, medical solutions. That's it. Um, the, uh, I also think you and I should have a different conversation one day about crunch. Cause I think you and I would disagree on crunch. Um, but the thing about anxiety, I will say that really the two things that pop to my brain are, it bothers me maybe when people aren't sympathetic towards it. Like I can tell you, I, I definitely do not right now want to get into a whole uh, can of worms, trans rights and all that stuff. But I can tell you that my son who is trans, when he recognized it and began struggling with it, we didn't know that's what it was. And we had him in therapy for anxiety and because he was anxious as all get out. It was, he wouldn't even go up and order a bagel at the bagel store. He just did not want to be seen and he was miserable. And the minute he came out and the minute we supported him, it was a 180. It wasn't drugs. It wasn't the man keeping him down. Well, in this case, maybe literally. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it was um, him not being able to sort of be who he was in his mind. Um, and, and so I just, it, it pisses me off sometimes. That's my own personal experience. But whether you're talking about that version of it or a version of it because somebody was raised this way or they have this fear, it's like, I think people should be kinder when people have these anxieties because it really is, um, it's a hell of a burden to bear and you have no idea. And even I guess with the trans thing, it bothers me. It's like, you shouldn't let the kids do this or that or the other. It's like, you don't know my kid. You don't know the struggles he was going through when this was pushed under the floorboards. And so you can say I'm a bad parent or I'm a mutilator or I am a child abuser because of the things we've done with our son, but you weren't there when this little kid who was happy for the first 12 years of their life became utterly miserable. And I just, I just, I think compassion is valuable. The last thing I'll say on anxiety is meditation. Um, for me, uh, I started meditating. I don't do it that often, but when I started meditating and I learned meditation, um, it absolutely changed my life um, because it allows you to have you know, and one could argue it's meditation is nothing more than sort of old school cognitive behavioral therapy, whatever it is. Um, it allowed me to have the space outside of the experience or the simulation, right? So anything now that happens in my life, even when I think of the worst possible thing, there is an ability for my consciousness or my brain or awareness to separate from sort of, and I don't mean this in a woo spiritual way. It's just a nice metaphor to separate from the play I'm performing in that is life. And I think when you have that meditation experience, which I, I've only had once, but once was enough mm. where I was able to see the isness above the present moment and go, this is just a, this is just a perception of your experience, but this is not you. The real you is kind of above this watching that stays with me and has stayed with me. And it doesn't mean I don't get anxious or upset or get caught up in the moment, but I'm always now because of that experience able to separate and go, you know, it's, it's, it's not as real or important or as you think it is, it's going to be fine. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to share that because if anyone's considering uh, totally secular, I'm not a religious person. It's not like Buddhism, but there, there are some great books out there. So hit me up on Twitter if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll send you some recommendations. But meditation, I think, has been a key way that I have alleviated my anxiety that I used to have a long time ago. Yeah, my wife swears by that too, Jeffy. She's really, really all about it. And I think it helps. I really do. Yeah. Oh, it de definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I was, until recently, I'm really not <clears throat> in the Sam Harris at all anymore. But I was in the Sam Harris for so long. And it's, I compartmentalized his whole, his intellectual interviews, which I loved from his his pursuit of um of meditation and he's like expertise in that which i just never pursued because I, I have a very i have to learn from stage one i have i have me quieting my mind sounds like an impossible task but certainly doable i just need to have the discipline but that's what people don't understand it's supposed to be right you're supposed to not like it 
You're so, the, the whole point of it is not to achieve some Zen experience. The point of it is to bring yourself to your meditation chair, cushion, whatever, and go, oh my God, this is my mind most times. It's awful. It's boring. It's drudgery. And I only can do it for 10 minutes at a time. Mm. But it's, it's not about, the change comes because you're recognizing, oh, these are just thoughts. These thoughts are not me. So the fact that you can't imagine quieting your mind is good because the more you recognize you can't quiet your mind, the more you begin to have the tools to allow you in the moment to go, oh, that's just my mind. That's not real. That's interesting. Yeah, I really should be more open, you know, not to be double entendre, but open minded about it. And uh, I don't I like many people, I don't gravitate towards things that I have to try at. Yeah, like it's like if I don't. If I, I'm very lucky that I was naturally athletic because I really took the sports because if I it's like when I pick up a pen to draw, it's a comical comical. Oh, yeah. you know, and so like and I'm just like, nah, forget it. <laughs> so same thing with meditation, but maybe I'll give it another go. But my friends, we've been going a while and we have a guest. So I want to be mindful of taking up too much more of your time. Jaffe, I appreciate you taking the time today, my friend. Do you have any closing comments? Yes, I appreciate you having me. It was a lot of fun. Um, I saw Gene Park on Twitter yesterday. That's where we hang out, you know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I want to do one of these with well, Jaffe. Yeah, can, I would love to come back. You can make that happen. And do something with Gene. Yeah. Um, but happen. the last thing I just, I, I wanted to say when it goes back to bullying, I'm not going to get into a detail about it, but I think I would be remiss not to mention that I think having a woman's perspective on adult bullying is probably exceptionally valuable. Definitely. Because the the amount of, of things I've seen where men, they don't even call it bullying, but I saw the, I, you know, it, it, it's... Their experience with other adults, usually men, but not always, uh, sort of being bullies to them in a variety of ways, I, I don't think you can really have the conversation without that perspective. And I just wanted to say that. But otherwise, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, no Ooh. doubt. And I, I agree with you generally. Having Micah on the shows, we've, we're getting me- like lots of messages from people that are really enjoying just having the like the, this kind of naturalistic female perspective that doesn't seem like we're trying to force it for any other reason than it's just another perspective, you know? Um, and I think that people are enjoying that. So I'm right. On. Woke. Yeah. Yeah. Woke. Woke. <laughs> uh, Dustin Furman, closing comments. I am You're fired. geared up. I'm, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> was it the not confidence part? What yeah, was it? No, it's a... Um, I'm so excited. This is good. I have a fantastic weekend ahead. Again, I don't want to jinx it. I had... So, also... Listen, I don't care. You can leave a comment and say, oh, get digital. But I got my physical copy of Resident Evil 4. I had Holly pop that bitch right into the PS5. So it's ready to go. Mm. So I'm going to do that. I think I'm watching a movie with some friends tomorrow. John Wick on Sunday. Last Stand uh, watch party tonight in the Discord. Just so many great things going on. And of course, this was like the perfect way to kick it off. So. I am very pleased, very, very blessed. And I hope you guys also have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm excited too. That's what I'm going to do this weekend is play RE4. And um, Hell yeah. I, uh, the digital version unlocked when I was on my, I was playing Octopath and it like the little thing popped up and it was like it was unlocked, but I was in there. I got to be patient so I can sit with it for some time, not just like play the first <laughs> half an hour of it. It's been so long since I played Resident Evil 4. I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah. So we'll have more on that sh- soon as well. And Dig, any closing comments from you, my friend? You guys aren't the brightest bulbs in the socket nope but i love you that anyway. is burned into your brain it is stuck with you <laughs> and if you feel bullied you should because it was fucking dumb. it was fucking dumb. i'm bringing it up in tribute to you every show Jeff. <laughs> we're gonna go with it every show all right my friend well that was fun thank you guys for taking the time especially you jaffe it's it's early out there too um so i appreciate it um no worries. And enjoy your Loved it. enjoy your Loved uh it. i love your gandalf gandalf pipe it's uh, <laughs> i was gonna do it and i felt all warm and fuzzy when you went elijah <laughs> um mm. do you know do you know mm. uh his brother produced twisted metal oh yeah just zach yeah. yeah yeah it was the weirdest thing i was having lunch with him when i first met him and we were talking about movies he goes oh my brother auditioned mm. for that and i'm like who's your brother and he's like, oh, Elijah. What? Like, oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody knew but me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Zach Wood, he looks like him, too, which is funny. Like when after you know that they're brothers and yeah, he's I'm still friendly with him. He just got a job somewhere. He did. No, he's heading up Jason Blum Blumhouse video right. game. They want to make under 10 million dollar horror games 
uh, in the same sort of philosophical, do whatever you want, but don't break the bank and we'll be the creative haven for horror on video games. Oh, wow. He's leading that whole initiative at Blumhouse. So That's awesome. he's great. Yeah, good for him. He's great. Yeah, he was uh, for people that don't know, you can probably look on Moby Games, but Zach Wood was a longtime producer at Sony and worked when Santa Monica Studio still had XDev running out of it, which is like the second party external independent development. He was working on a lot of that stuff. That's when I because I knew him. He was doing like some pixel junk stuff and mm-hmm. sound shapes, which was fucking awesome that he produced that. He also produced that. Remember that weird game Bound about the dancer? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that it seemed like so he was he was all over the place. But yeah, he's a good guy. I'm glad. And was, then Nathan Gary is running Annapurna. Right. The whole fucking thing. Right. Not just Annapurna games and a fucking Perna. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, wow. The fuck is happening? Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, it's a lot. It's Santa Monica. I mean, you too, obviously. Santa Monica is a huge source yeah. of of major um you know, major experience and and I keep trying to get Shannon to come produce my fucking show, but she's like, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. you're too vulgar for me. Yeah, where I, which I, I, I reached out to her actually because she and I have always been friendly. I don't know if she got back. I don't think she got back to me. I'd like to have her on the show. I'll mention it. I'll I'll, I'll mention her. She doesn't like doing a lot of this stuff. She just really is not that. But I should tell her. I mean, she's working at a company right now that's doing some really interesting user created content. But I'm not sure what her long-term plan is, cool yeah that'd be awesome i will mention i talked to her i'll, I'll let her yeah, know please do yeah for, we're talking about shannon stud still for people that don't know she ran S- santa monica for a long time uh sony santa monica and she she's really interesting and i remember especially trying to convince her I, i'll never forget it the canceled santa monica game that they've never really discussed right the sci-fi game oh, uh, I, yeah. yeah i i've tried i know quite a bit about it and we talk about it on, on yeah and i'm sure you do too like I tried to tell her when she was still there. I'm like, I think you guys should talk about this openly as like an aborted project. What went wrong? How can you learn about it? Not just a GDC thing, but like make it part of the DNA of the studio, how you became back stronger. And I think I actually set a seed in her mind where she was actually kind of interested in maybe trying to do that. But I could be I could be wrong. And that was the last time. Probably I have Sony legal coming in going, well, if you tell what went wrong, these four people are going to feel, you know, slighted and then they could sue. I mean, Sony legal is like. You know, other than the acquisition with Activision, they're pretty yeah. good. Um, you saw what happened today, right? The CMA yeah. said, fuck it. You guys are good to go. Yeah, so that should be the end of that. I think that will be the end of that. Um, but yeah, I saw that. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. She's she's cool. I'd like to talk to her one day. And uh, there's a lot of people that came out of Santa Monica that are fascinating. But um, Jeffy, we appreciate your time again. Be well. We'll have you back on. And I, I already wrote right. down, we'll have you on with Gene next time. So we'll do Perfect. We'll do- All right. I'm just going to hit hang up, right? I'm just well, going to go. Not yet. It's not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Here. All right. We'll tell you. All right. Well, well that's it for us. <laughs> Jeffy wants to go. So we're going to go. We'll see you next time. Until no, then. No, I'm just saying, I don't know what to say. Do I hang up no, no, or stay, you say goodbye? Hey, we're going to say goodbye. That's the end of the show. Okay. Goodbye. We'll say goodbye on the show and then we'll say goodbye after. Right. Right. Stop. Exactly. <laughs> All right. That's it. Let's let's end it. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> at David Scott Jaffe on Twitter. Come see me at YouTube. At, uh, all right, yeah, of course. Goodbye. Yeah, all that. Plugs. Goodbye. Bye. Constellation is a product of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 